Silent Witch Fall 8, Night's Life Arc. V8C1, to etch this name into the history. As with GT Silent Witch August 23rd. 2021 6 minutes Serendia Academy principal felt his stomach churning like it never had before. Right now, his guest, Darius Knightley, the second most important person in this country after the king, or as people called him Duke Crockford, sitting across from him. As the most powerful noble in the country, he has Serendia Academy covered in his influence. Not to mention, Felix Ark Riddle. The second prince of this country and Duke Crockford's grandson, was attending this very school. At the chess tournament where the second prince had managed, an intruder was pretending to be a teacher from another school, which likely resulted in some criticisms for his inadequate security. Fortunately, the intruder was quickly apprehended and the second prince was not injured, but even so, Duke Crockford would not let that fact slip by. While holding back his shivering, the principal glanced at the sitting Duke Crockford across him. The man with the little over sixty figure and his pale blonde hair that had begun to turn into white has no resemblance to those older worn out people. In his younger days, his good looks alone had captured many noble women's hearts. Despite his age, he always had a sharpness like a blade that never rusted. His bearing was strict and ruthless. Among the noble society, he was known for his shrewdness. I've heard the reports, the moment the Duke opened his mouth, the air in the room suddenly became heavier. As if having an invisible pressure on his back, the principal unconsciously tightened his grip on his stomach. Regarding the school festival, the principal responded quickly to the Duke's brief words. Oh of course, His Highness safety is our top priority, so we would cancel. It will be carried out as planned, that was such short order, but the principal couldn't disobey. In front of this duke, he was not allowed to even questioning his reason. The principal knew, in the past, people who questioned the duke's orders were forced to be exiled from the kingdom. We will strengthen security, and carry out the school festival as planned, good, just as the duke nodded, a knock resounded on the door of the guest room. The one who said, come in, was not the principal, but the duke. That very fact clearly showed who the ruler of this place was. Pardon my intrusion, Felix Ark Riddle, the duke's grandson, the second prince of this country, entered the room upon opening the door. He bowed his head to his grandfather with a hint of apology on his ever so gentle face. It's been a long time, grandfather. I deeply apologize for causing you so much worry, to his sincere and apologetic grandson, the Duke asked in a calm voice. How are you feeling, I am fine. It brings me so much pleasure when I heard here of your arrival, grandfather. I am very grateful to you for coming here despite your busy schedule. When Felix politely expressed his gratitude, the Duke nodded back silently. Their exchange seemed casual but the principal secretly felt relieved when knowing the Duke had rushed to the academy for his grandson. It had been scary when the Duke forced him to carry out the school festival as planned, but he was certain the Duke had something in mind. Indeed. I bet His Excellency had been looking forward to seeing his precious grandson's debut. That's why he gave an order to proceed with the school festival. As the principal was convincing himself this way, the Duke turned his gaze at him. I need to talk with Felix for a moment. The principal quickly stood up, understanding his unspoken intention to ask him to leave this room. Even if he was the principal of this school, if Duke Crockford told him to leave the room, he couldn't do anything but obey. After the principal left the room, Duke Crockford's calm face contorted slightly. In a distant manner, and in an abhorrent manner. You disgrace. Felix did not change his expression despite the harsh words spat out lowly. However, his gentle expression was no longer there, and his blue eyes, like glass beads that had lost their light, reflected the Duke. Its appearance was exactly that of a lifeless puppet. You have neglected to take precautions against outsiders. That carelessness led to this incident, with all due respect, Minerva, Anne, Temple. 
had a deep friendship for a long time with Serendia Academy. I believe it would be rude to be persistently cautious, don't talk back to me. The Duke dismissed Felix's nonchalant rebuttal with a single word and told him brusquely. You must make the festival a success. I've invited all the major lords to the festival. Show them the dignity of Felix Ark Riddle. To be more precise, the authority of the Duke Crockford household. Soon, it will be time to determine the next king. And the current king will nominate one of his three sons to be his successor. For that reason. Felix had to make his presence known at this school festival. Understanding the Duke's intentions, Felix quietly bowed and said in a voice devoid of emotion, Come as you wish, Your Excellency. Returning to his room, Felix went straight to the closet, opened its door, and pulled out a new set of clothes. It was not the school's uniform, nor was it a glamorous outfit suitable for a second prince to wear. It was a subdued colored outfit that was devoid of ornate decorations. He took off the uniform he had been wearing and draped it over the sofa, causing a white lizard to slip out of the pocket of his uniform. After landing on the floor, well, the lizard, transformed into a young man in a servant's uniform. Your Highness, if you wear that outfit, don't tell me are you planning, it's been a while since I've had a chance to cut loose, can I? Felix smiled at Will's dismay. Most people would have nodded without a second thought if begged with that charming smile, but Will was resolved to give him some talk. There are only two days left until the school festival. After the chess tournament the other day, it would be best to refrain from playing at night until the festival is over. This is only my prediction, but I think Duke Crockford will give me some kind of role next time after he successfully presented me at the school festival. Whether it was diplomacy with other countries, a dragon slaying mission, or even an engagement announcement. Felix predicted that once the Duke made Felix's presence known to the lords at the school festival, the Duke would do anything to create more glamorous topics in his discussion. I have hardly any free time left, will you help me? Will Adian, Will looked at Felix with a sorrowful face and gave one small nod. Soon after, Will's figure blurred and dissolved into water. When the distortion regained its outline, it was not a young man in a squire's uniform, but a man with the exact same appearance as Felix. This was the kind of illusion Will was best at. As a high-ranking spirit of water, Will may not be good at fighting or sensing threats, but when it comes to illusion, he has no equal. For this reason, the fact that Will can be his body double was very useful when Felix need to go out. Now, Will has the hair, the eyes, the skin color, the delicate and beautiful face, which was everything perfectly similar to Felix. The only difference was the somewhat sad expression on his face. Felix then quietly told his body double. This is probably my last time to cut loose, Will said nothing only reflecting his sad face. A face just like his own was staring at him sadly. Looking at such a strange sight, Felix responded with a wry smile. I won't, of course, stray away from my true objective. Felix closed his eyes and then slowly opened them. Under his long golden eyelashes, a spark of determination shone eerily hidden deep within beautiful blue with a hint of green eyes. Dot. I. Felix Ark Riddle, will do whatever it takes to etch this name down into the history, that vow has never wavered even now, in the past ten years. At least, let me enjoy my last time to cut loose, so whether to be his puppet, dog, or whatever it was, I'll let him whatever he wants me to be. V8C2, Mary Harvey, Star Oracle Witch, S Exciting Horoscope Azareth GT Silent Witch August 25th. 2021 7 minutes at night, two days before the upcoming school festival. Monica was invited to a luxurious mansion, in there, she sat squirming uncomfortably on the couch, attended by the handsome servant boys. While Lewis Miller, the barrier magician, crossed his legs arrogantly, after receiving a drink from the handsome servant boys. Across from her sat a silver-haired charming beauty, 
who was also attended by a group of handsome servant boys as she sipped her glass of wine. She was the owner of the mansion, Mary Harvey, the star oracle witch, a seven sage who was similar to Monica and Lois. With the charming innocent girl and the gracefulness of a mature woman, the star oracle witch was a beautiful woman whose age was unknown. However, it has already been more than 30 years since she was appointed as the seven sages, making her the oldest of the current seven sages. Through Lewis, Monica has been invited to this mansion this morning. Mary was eager to talk to Monica, but she was working on a top secret mission outside her mountain cabin at the moment, which the details could not be talked about. To hide this fact, instead of wearing the Serendia Academy uniform, Monica dressed in simple casual clothes and slipped out of the dormitory with the help of Louis to visit Mary's mansion. You um. I am very grateful for envy, 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 invite. When Monica uttered the words of greeting with a tense face, Mary giggled like a tinkling bell. Oh dear, you don't have to be so tense. Okay, how about a glass of pearl and red wine you're already a fully grown adult, so you can drink wine right? Maybe a light sip will help ease your tension. The handsome servant boy quickly came to stand beside Monica with a bottle of wine in his hand, but Louis dismissed it with a wave of his hand. I would advise not doing so if you wish to have a proper conversation. Miss, silent witch, can be quite a handful when she is drunk. I once accidentally gave her some drink at my house and the result was a disaster. You you. Monica clutched her chest at Louis' harsh words. It happened when Monica was staying at Louis Miller's mansion in preparation for her mission to escort the second prince, and there, Monica accidentally drank some of Louis' treasured wine. What happened later was devastating. Though the rest was drunk by Louis himself. Aw, oh, that's too bad guess juice will do then. T thank you. Monica sipped the juice poured by the handsome servant boy and scanned the room. Mary Harvey, the star oracle witch, was born from the Marcus family and had served the kingdom as one of the seven sages for many years, so it was quite fitting that her mansion was gorgeous and opulent. The windows were especially impressive. The glass used here was so luxurious that allows one to see the outside scenery clearly. It may have been made this way because she needed it for her prophecy, but it was extravagantly nonetheless. You um. As so, what do you want to talk about? When Monica asked timidly, Mary sipped her glass and smiled softly. Oh please, there is nothing serious here. I just wanted to chat with you for the first time in a while with that. Mary moved her half-closed eye toward Lewis and looked at him. Though I believe I didn't give you an invitation, I will permit it in consideration of your beautiful face, Lewis. I do love beautiful things, after all. Ha ha ha, I am so flattered to hear that, Lewis might have said he was flattered, but his manner said the otherwise. Which made Mary let out a sigh sadly. Such a pity. If only you were 15 years younger, I would have made you my personal servant. Oh, how kind of you. Maybe you could expect me grown some beard in the next meeting, you're not cute. What do you expect from a grown up man to look cute, when Lewis responded brusquely. Mary put a fan to her mouth with a sorrowful look on her face and said, This is why I don't prefer grown-up men. Dot. Both Mary and Louis have rather stubborn personalities, but they were unquestionably beautiful. Watching them chatting and laughing while being served by handsome boys was quite a sight to behold. It made her wonder why she had been invited here. She was the only one who didn't fit in this place. Even the servants would find it hard to relate Monica to the seven sages like Louis and Mary. As Monica fidgeted with her glass, clutching it with both hands, Mary gave Monica a friendly smile. I'm actually happy to have you around, Monica. We are the only girls among the seven sages, aren't we? So I want to get to know you better, all right? Monica gave a vague response and Lewis was about to say something but held back. He probably wanted to say something like, isn't it too much to call yourself a girl at your age, even so, 
He showed her some consideration to the extent that he swallowed those words. After all, Mary Harvey was presumably the oldest of the seven sages and the only one in the kingdom who was dubbed as the prophetess. The seven sages had their own specialties in magic which was stood above among the other magicians. Just as Monica was skilled in no chance spells and Lewis and Barrier spells, Mary Harvey, the star oracle witch, was skilled in astrology. It was relatively uncommon for people to study astrology, but Mary's astrological accuracy was unsurpassed among them. Moreover, the king trusted her immensely and dubbed her the prophetess. At the meeting of the seven sages, she was the one who mainly presided over it. Monica suddenly had a thought. Could Mary want to reprimand Monica in a roundabout way for the fact that she kept skipping the seven sages meeting? After all, it had been almost two years since Monica had been appointed as the seven sages. And her attendance in the meetings held every month or two can be counted in one hand. Um. I am sorry I have been skipping the meetings lately, Monica made the first move and apologized, and Mary smiled broadly. No need to apologize. In fact, it's always ended up with Lewis and the jewel magician, exchanging sarcastic remarks, while the thorns witch, happily eating vegetables, and the cannon magician, snoring in his seat. Just for your information, the abyss shaman, attendance rate is less than half of yours, this fact alone almost made the image of the seven sages shattered into a million pieces. You don't have to be so nervous, even I would say you're the most diligent person among the seven sages. Right, the other day, thank you for helping me calculate the observation records for my students really, you've been a lifesaver when she was holed up in the mountain cabin. Monica took on the task of calculating the star orbit observed by the astronomers who were Mary Harvey's students. It was one of the most difficult tasks that Monica had ever taken. It was such a challenging job for her, so Monica remembered it well. If I recall correctly, it was a decade-long record of a single star, right? I've recalculated it several times, after all. What happened to that star now? Mary can predict the future of a country or a person by the color of the star, the number of times it blinks, its orbit, and its distance from other stars. What Monica can do is calculate the results of the observations, but she has no idea whose fate is implied by the results. So she simply calculated the orbit from the observation results and provided the results to Mary. However, she knew one thing. Mary had been sensing a strange movement of a certain star for about 10 years. Incidentally, whose star is that you've been want to foresee about, lady, star oracle witch? It was the second princess, His Highness Felix Ark Riddle's star. Monica gulped involuntarily while Louis' eyebrows twitched just a little without changing his expression. Perhaps noticing their reaction. Mary put her hand on her cheek and let out a sigh of depression I've been foreseeing many futures of the kingdom, especially on the royal family, but for the past ten years, I've been unable to read His Highness Felix's destiny, at Mary's words, Monica's heart stirred quietly. Mary's star oracle was not all-powerful, and she herself was well aware not everything can be foreseen. Still. The fact that she was unable to read Felix's destiny at this moment gave Monica a strange feeling of uneasiness. An assassination attempt by Casey, an intruder at a chess tournament. Amidst all the disturbing things happening, the school festival was approaching in two days. I have a bad feeling about this. As Monica held her chest and cast her head down, Mary leaned forward to peek at Monica's face. On the surface of Mary's somewhat unfocused light blue eyes, Monica's figure was reflected there. Um. Lady, Star Oracle Witch, why look so gloomy? All right, as thanks for helping me with my work, how about I foresee your destiny a little bit? Mary rose slowly to her feet and stood at the window, dragging a thin silk robe with her. She then looked up at the stars in the night sky with her clear eyes then declared Monica's destiny she foresaw. I can foresee your love life is on a roll right now. Moreover, 
You might end up spending a passionate night with a nice gentleman. Monica hung her head, looking like she was about to throw up, and covered her face with her hands. Comma I it's still too early for me e. Just a few days ago, she had received a proposal of engagement based on chess. While Lewis was, that's a bit too crude for a prophecy from the Seven Sage, muttered in amazement. V8C3, Monica turns into a bad girl as Earth GT silent which August 28, 2021 10 minutes Mary Harvey, the star oracle witch, suggested Monica for staying over, but considering tomorrow was the day before the school festival, she declined politely. In fact, no classes would be held on that day. However, student council members and students who were going to perform need to show up in order to prepare for the festival. For that reason, Monica also had to show up once before noon. After walking away from Mary's mansion for a while, a little yellow bird flew down from the sky. It spun around above her spot, then immediately transformed into a beautiful woman in a mage uniform. It was Lynn, Lewis' contracted spirit. Have you enjoyed your drink feast? Lewis's brow wrinkled deeply at Lynn's remark. Comma don't speak those words when in front of my wife. He felt guilty when remembering his wife was pregnant at home but he had indulged in a drinking spree. To which, Lynn affirmed in response. Understood. I will tell Madam that Sir Lewis was having a drinking spree accompanied by handsome boys. Looks like your mouth needs to be disciplined. But before that... I have a task for you. Take Miss, Silent Witch, back to Serendia Academy. Lewis can travel fast with his flight spell, but Monica can barely use it yet, except for leaping. It would take a horse-drawn carriage half a day to get from Mary's mansion to Serendia Academy, but with the use of flight spell, it can be done in no time at all. I guess I really should practice my flight spell. While Monica was pondering these thoughts, Lewis continued as he rebuttoned his coat. I also have a slight concern when the Star Oracle Witch told us the second prince's fate can't be predicted, right? As for the intruder at the chess tournament, I have instructed my men to send him to the capital shortly. That way, I can use all my hands to make him reveal the mastermind. I also have some doubt about that intruder identity, Lewis creaked his gloved fingers afterward. Monica knew, his hands which were finely shaped and refined like those of nobles had splendid calluses for punching. She secretly felt sorry for the intruder who was about to be interrogated by him. My colleague, please keep your vigilant during the school festival. Just in case, I'll lend you this useless maid. Use her as you fit, miss, silent witch, you can leave the task of assisting to this excellent maid. Lindbergh Field, in response to Lewis's sarcasm, Lynn introduced herself like that of the head maid without changing her color. Her thick face was something Monica would like to learn. Lewis glanced at his brazen contract spirit and gave a small cough. Also, I will be there on the day of the festival. While I do have another task to do, I'll try my best to help you with the escort, having Lynn, who can oversee a wide area. And Lewis, who was skilled in the barriers, could not be more reassuring than this. Monica bowed to Lewis and said, I'll be glad if you can help me but Lynn blurted out. Comma shouldn't it have been Sir Lewis who need to bow to ask for help. With his smile remaining on his face, Lewis wordlessly kicked Lynn in the leg. Lynn's flight spell was a little different from that used by human magicians. Unlike ordinary flight magic where the magician wrapped a thin membrane-like barrier on his body to fly. In Lynn's case, she created a hemispherical barrier around herself to bring everyone within it. It may sound easy, but it's impossible for a human's mana to maintain a hemispherical barrier while traveling at high speed for a long period of time. That's probably why Lewis, despite swearing a lot, valued Lynn's abilities. It had been 30 minutes since they had been flying in the sky. After scanning the ground below, Lynn then spoke. We will be arriving at Serendia Academy shortly. Oh, incredible, that was fast. I do provide some landing methods you can choose. 
To be more specific, I have the tornado kick landing method, the head spin landing method, and the grand wheel method. The main point is, I've made some modifications in the shape of the barrier to make it easier to spin. Was the method Lynn and Lewis previously used when landing the old garden included among them? All of them were nothing but worrisome, so Monica quickly said. You use the safest landing method, please, as you wish. Proceeding to decrease our speed, Tim, Lynn, who had been looking at the ground, tilted her head 90 degrees to the side with a snap. Her creepy reaction, like a doll with a broken head, was a sign that she was expressing her puzzling behavior in her own way. Dot. I have detected a suspicious carriage parked near the Serendia Academy Boys Dormitory, A. Eh? Shall we land in a spot nearby, so we can scout out the carriage? Lynn's flight magic worked by moving hemispherical barrier, so it's not suitable for scouting through wooded areas, since it would collide with the trees and make a loud noise. As such, she needed some open space for her to have a quiet landing. Monica pondered for a moment before giving Lynn some instruction. Comma I'm planning to use Farsight, so can you maintain your barrier in a fixed position? Certainly, the Farsight spell works the same way as using a telescope. So when using it while moving or something obstructed her view, that would make it harder for her to see the object. After having Lynn fixed her flight spell and still, Monica activated Farsight without chanting. The carriage, which parked secretly near the boys' dormitory, was a small carriage with two wheeled and few ornaments, a plain one. But Monica soon realized that it was protected by high-level magic tools. The whole carriage has a simple protective barrier and a soundproof barrier, it's likely using some kind of engineering in the wheel to suppress vibration, perhaps it's for a noble traveling in secret? She can't see the coachman's face clearly since his head was covered in a hat with his face hidden by a scarf. Is there someone inside the carriage? After carefully looking at the carriage, Monica noticed someone sneaking out of the boys' dormitory and approaching the carriage. It was a rather tall man wearing a hooded cloak with black hair peeking out from between the hoods. Realized, Monica exclaimed in surprise. Even he changed his hair color. She could still see the golden ratio of his body. It was impossible for her to mistake him for someone else. H his. His Highness, without a doubt, it was Felix who had slipped out of the boy's dormitory. After which he got into the carriage then closed the door before letting the carriage travel quietly. That direction is heading to the entertainment district. Is he having a secret night out? Wah, wah, what do we do? Monica flustered as she held her head with both hands. Originally, she should have stopped Felix, but the carriage had already left. Monica was Felix's bodyguard. She can't just let him go like this. I feel bad for Nero, who's staying at the dormitory, but... Lynn, please continue following the carriage, understood. As Lynn mentioned... The carriage carrying Felix stopped in the town near Serendia Academy where the entertainment district was. Once they were inside the city, it would be difficult to follow him with flight magic. So Monica asked Lynn to land quietly with the safest method and followed Felix on foot afterward. Instead of letting Lynn remain in human form, Monica requested Lynn to transform herself into a little bird and have her hide inside the cloak. The humanoid Lynn stands out whether she is a man or a woman, after all. Afterward, Monica pulled her hood up tightly over her eyes and cautiously followed Felix's back. The entertainment district was surprisingly bright at night, where sketchy stalls lined up at every end of the street, along with touts and flamboyantly dressed women calling out to passers-by. The reason why there were so many people here even though it was night time was probably related to local nobles who were staying in the town near the Serendia Academy to participate in the school festival. The touts were busy calling out to these wealthy guests, never paying attention to Monica. It was not surprising if one considering her plain appearance. They probably saw Monica as nothing more than a maid on an errand. After getting off the carriage. 
Felix took off the hooded cloak he was wearing when he sneaked out of the boys' dormitory, replaced it with a stylish frock coat and hat, and strolled proudly through the night streets. He strolled over through the stalls, waved one hand back at a smiling prostitute who threw a kiss at him while casually dismissed the touts. Rather than of a young man unaccustomed to the nightlife or a nobleman who had just come from the countryside, his behavior was more like someone who was used to hanging out like this. I've seen him sneaking out before, but, well, I guess this proved that he's used to hanging out like this. In this regard, she was not particularly disillusioned or disappointed, let alone harbored the image of the perfect prince. So whether she saw Felix spend his nights out or played with women, she couldn't care less. She just found it surprising. Felix has always had a calm and friendly demeanor, but at the same time, very careful and a perfectionist. This can be clearly seen in the way he has conducted himself in the student council. Now that Felix was doing something like this had made Monica feel him strangely out of place. At any rate. I need to escort His Highness back to the dormitory safely. Perhaps it was because of these thoughts, it had made her look away for a moment, letting her lost sight of Felix's back. Ah, Monica panicked and ran off from her spot. She searched the crowd for the figure of a young man with dark hair, wearing a stylish coat and hat, but she could not find him. I'm sorry, Lynn. I lost him, I'll search from above. Please wait a moment, from within Monica's cloak, Lynn, in the form of a small bird, flew out and soared into the sky. It would be best to stay quiet until Lynn found him, so she decided to move over to the side of the street quietly. But then, someone tapped her on the shoulder. Excuse me, young lady, I wouldn't recommend hanging out at night without a companion. Monica turned around at the familiar voice and saw Felix standing there. However, his hat and coat, which Monica had been using as a mark, had been taken off and held in his arm. Looking at Monica who was opening and closing her mouth, Felix put his coat back on, wearing the face of a child who had succeeded in his mischief. Most amateurs in tailgating like to use things their targets wear as markers. Just take off the hat and coat, they'll be fooled in no time, their black hair, which was a different color than usual was likely to be a wig. Felix dexterously put his hat back on while holding it with his fingertips to prevent the wig from slipping off. Now, care to tell me why you are here? Are you having a secret date perhaps, you uh, well, I it's not a secret date, but, uh, I saw you, your highness, and I was curious, so I followed you. I believe this place is quite far from there if you considering the distance. So. How did you manage to catch up with me? There was no way Monica could say that she was following him from the sky using a flight spell. Monica's eyes whirled in circles, her mind racing to come up with an unfamiliar excuse. And, after using the most brilliant mind of the country's foremost magician, the silent witch of the seven sages to the full throttle, the result was, T the truth is, I am a bad girl so I it's normal if I'm here hanging out at night. And then, I accidentally spotted you, your highness. Felix was completely blank and silent for a few seconds. The next moment, he released his breath and laughed in trembling. A bad girl you are? PFFT, haha. I see, I guess we both are a bad boy and a bad girl, then, all right. A bad boy and a bad girl, here's a suggestion. Since we both are bad people, why don't we hanging out together for a night out? It would be as twice as fun when you have someone to enjoy it with. For Monica, this proposal was something she could not have wished for. This way, she would be able to guard Felix without reservation. Oh okay. L let's have fun together. Her way of bowing her head was contradicted with the behavior of someone who called herself a bad girl. But Felix was shaking really hard, suppressing his laughter. You really never cease to surprise me. I never thought I'd have someone to accompany me on my last break. Comma Monica looked up at Felix's face quizzically, but Felix gave her a somewhat mischievous smile different from his usually calm face. 
And yet, the smile he gave while letting the corners of his eyes slightly lowered, exuded a kind of seductive charm unlike what he had during the day. Felix put his finger on Monica's cheek and leaned closer to examine her face. Here, you should refer to me as Eeg, okay, El Lord Eeg, could it be a derivation of Felix's middle name, Ark? Lord Eeg, Lord Eeg, said Monica, rolling the unfamiliar name around on her tongue, to which Felix pressed his index finger against her lips. Not Lord Eeg, but just Eeg. We're fellow bad people, remember. Be but, Felix laughed at Monica's bafflement, showing his white teeth, holding out his hand to her. Like he was having fun so much. Let's go, Monica. Time flies very fast when the sun goes down. So, how about we enjoy ourselves tonight to have some fun together? V8C4, the house of Madame Cassandra Azareth GT Silent which August 30th, 2021 9 minutes, Miss. Silent Monica, can you hear me? Monica, who's been walking alongside Felix, heard Lynn's voice out of nowhere. She looked around in alarm, but Felix and the other passersby didn't seem to notice. Can you hear me? I am now speaking directly to your eardrums, apparently. Lynn could speak directly to Monica's eardrums through vibration. It looked simple but was a highly advanced technique. At the very least. It's not something a human being can do. I've confirmed that Miss, Silent Witch, has successfully met up with the second prince. I will be guarding the two of you in the air. If everything is all right, please raise your right hand. Monica raised her right hand, pretending to fix the rim of her hood, and found a small yellow bird on the roof of the store ahead. I may not be able to enter the building, but I can hear most of the conversations. If there's an emergency, please do not hesitate to summon me, although Monica appreciated Lynn's support, one wrong move and she might break in as a man in a flamboyant costume, just like last time. She was making a mental note to keep Lynn's help as a last resort if possible when Felix tapped Monica on the shoulder. By the way, Monica, what kind of places do you usually hang out at, eh? Felix laughed in a somewhat meaner way than usual. Monica broke out in a lazy cold sweat, desperately trying to figure out what a night out is all about. As a person who basically never went out through the days facing the numbers and magic formulas, the word hanging out was a known territory. Much less a night out. What is she supposed to do when she goes out at night? As bad girl, you should be used to the nights out, right? Can you tell me what kind of places do you usually go to, W? Well, that's, Monica, who had been groaning, suddenly had an idea. That's right, she had just experienced the night out. Moreover, it was the kind of experience that ordinary people can't afford. This must be the exemplary answer to a night out. Her eyes lit up like when she found the solution to a difficult mathematical equation. So she answered confidently. Having a drinking feast accompanied by handsome boys, Felix burst into a hearty laugh. Furthermore, there were tears welling up in the corners of his eyes. He wiped away his tears of laughter as Monica was stunned by his attitude, which was unthinkable from the usual Felix. If you prefer that kind of thing, I can take you to a nice place like that. No, I've had my fill of that sort of thing, so. In fact, just a few minutes ago, she had been attended by a beautiful boy at the, Star Oracle Witch, S. Mansion. Yar. I mean Lord Eeg, I don't mind if you choose the place, it's Eeg, T then, E Eeg, I don't mind if you choose the place, responding meekly, Monica let out a small sneeze and shuddered. The blowing wind in the autumn where the winter was reaching can be so cold. Some of the people on the street were already wearing fur coats. As Monica rubbed her numb fingers together, Felix wrapped his hand around hers and blew a breath of air. The white cloudy breath softly floated then disappearing as if it were melting to the dark night. Monica tilted her head. Um. I think breathing on my hands won't make any difference. Then, how about this? Felix loosened his scarf slightly and grabbed Monica's hand to touch his own neck. 
Monica's small hand touched Felix's slender, white neck. The warmth of human skin spread slowly into Monica's numb fingertips. The comfort feeling made her mouth loosened, then she remembered the ridiculous reality that she had her hand touched Felix's neck before jumping away. Iowa, um, well, in times like this, if you open and close your hands, the blood will circulate and wah 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 warm your fingers, if you had to repeat your words like that. I guess it has to be very warm, Felix chuckled as he removed the warm scarf and wrapped it around Monica's neck. Before that, I guess we should find you some warm clothes first. Follow me. Felix brought her to the most gorgeous two-story building in the entertainment district. Upon entering the gorgeously decorated entrance, she was greeted by the intriguing scent of flowers in an opulent vase, mixed with the smell of incense. Although he said he was looking for winter clothes, she assumed he was going to a clothing store, but it was pretty obvious to everyone that this place did not sell clothes. It was a store that offered an exciting time with beautifully dressed ladies. This, 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 are you craving some fish? Monica shook her head as she struggled to speak. I, I mean, W what kind of place is this? The house of Madame Cassandra, so Felix replied, and then a woman stepped out from the back of the store. She was dressed boldly, her amber hair in a loose updo exposing her shoulders and chest. She giggled like a cat who's found a prize, nibbled on the base of Felix's neck, and kissed him passionately on the cheek. Sir Baron. I haven't seen you in a long time. You haven't shown up at all lately, I missed you so much. Hi, Doris. Sorry I've been so busy lately. Hey, why don't you pick me tonight? Since you're here. I'll turn down all other reservations for tonight, the woman called Doris whispered in a tempting voice, to which Felix returned a kiss on Doris' cheek and said. Sorry, I have some business with Madame Cassandra, that's a shame, Doris seemed to finally notice Monica's presence there, and with her body still entwined with Felix's, she turned her head to look at Monica. There was no malice in her gaze, simply to be genuinely assessing Monica's value. Him. For a woman he brought, she doesn't look like she's going to get many customers, muttered Doris before turning her gaze back to Felix. Whatever. Oh, right, Madame Cassandra's in the back room. This way, this way, Doris wrapped her own arms around Felix's left arm and started walking. Then found Monica still confused there, so she yelled at her in exasperation. Come on, what are you standing there for? Look, his right arm is free right now, eh? Doris beckoned Monica to stand on the right side of Felix. She then grabbed Monica's hand and forcibly entangled it in Felix's right arm, while she herself clung back to his left arm. This is how you entwine your arms. Press your chest against his body more, and, uh, well, maybe you don't have any chest to press against. What am I being forced to do thought Monica before turning her gaze to Felix with a troubled look on her face, only to find him trying hard to hold his laughter. You um, I guess I should introduce you to the madam first. All right, Monica replied vaguely and started walking with her arm entwined in Felix's, or more like holding his hand like a lost child. The house of Madame Cassandra was one of the most popular establishments in this entertainment district and whether it was the decorations on the pillars, doors, or the carpets, the whole place was so gorgeous it hurt her eyes. The mansion of Mary Harvey, the Star Oracle Witch, was also luxurious but compared to this store, hers was much more elegant, Monica thought to herself. Eventually, Doris stopped in front of a room at the end of the corridor. Madam. Madam Cassandra. I brought you a good man after a long time, he's coming to see you, come in, the voice coming from inside the room was that of a woman who had been drunk. Doris opened the door in a good mood and let Felix and Monica in. Though the corridor leading up to this place was quite gorgeous, the inside of that room was even more painful to the eyes. Carpets in red tones, curtains made of velvet, the decorations and tassels which had been crafted with a lot of goldwork and gold thread. 
and in the center of the room, a woman was sitting on a cat-legged couch. She, with beautifully coiffed gray hair, bright scarlet dress, and wide-brimmed hat, was already past her prime age, but far too vibrant to be considered old. Her amber eyes, glistening with a strong glow, were reflecting Felix's. Oh, my, Sir Baron. It's been a while since I've seen you. You know, the girls in the store have been losing motivation because you haven't been showing up lately, I apologize for that, madam. A few things have come up in my business, what kind of a business does he have, he's just a student. However, looking at Felix now, no one would think that he was a student. He was far too used to the nightlife. I'd better not say something unnecessary. When Monica took a step back and hid behind Felix, the woman known as Madame Cassandra cocked her chin and looked at Monica. Who's that girl? Oh, I was wondering if you could take care of her clothes. I want her looking more appropriate in this city. This proved he was not lying when he told her that he was looking for warm clothes for Monica. Regular clothing stores would have long since closed by now. So, he figured it would be quicker to get some clothes and pay for them at this kind of store. Doris said, in that case, leave it to me, in response and grabbed Monica's wrist. Come on, this way, but, I, Monica looked at Felix and Doris alternately in dismay, but Felix just smiled and waved at her. Have her get dressed beautifully, W wait, I, come on, get moving. Doris grabbed the flustered Monica's wrist and started walking with a big stride, half dragged to another room. After watching Monica being dragged away by Doris, Felix sat down on the couch across from Madame Cassandra, which she then opened a locked drawer of her cabinet, took out a few envelopes from it, and placed them before him afterward. Baron Grimton, Count Morin, Count Ashint, Marcus Bardia, it was from the nobles you met in this store. Thanks for all your help as always, madam. Felix thanked her, took the envelopes, and put them in his pocket without checking the contents. The nobles that madam Cassandra mentioned had one thing in common. They are all nobles affiliated with Duke Crockford. Of course, the perceptive madam Cassandra must have been aware of this. I don't mean to pry too deeply, but, are you going to stop coming to this store? I afraid so. Felix placed a bag of gold coins in front of Madame Cassandra, who sighed, my precious guest in response. This should be enough for you to have a big party tonight, and of course you're going to be at that party, aren't you? No, I've got other places to go. If you could just lend me a place to sleep tonight, that would be enough. Madame Cassandra, with a sullen look on her face, took out a smoking pipe and sucked the tip of it into her bright red lips. For the last time, you can bring in as many girls from my store as you like to your room, that might not be a bad idea, though. On my way here, I made a night out friend, albeit in an unexpected way, so I'd planning to take her as my priority today. Hmm. Madame Cassandra widened her eyes, which had been squinting moodily, and blinked. Comma could it be that the dull girl from earlier, yes, she's my friend. When Felix answered plainly, Madame Cassandra put her hand on her forehead and looked up at the ceiling. What a bummer. I thought she was going to be sold to one of our stores. As Madame Cassandra blurted this out, she heard a clattering sound of running in the corridor. Moments later, Doris came running into the room with Monica by her side. Madame. Madame. Madame, in Doris's arms, who was raising her voice. Monica was mumbling numbers with vacant eyes. Felix rounded his eyes at the sight of her appearance in a flimsy dress, like the ones the girls in this store wear, which looked like underwear. A kind of revealing dress that would look good on a woman as voluptuous as Doris, but when worn by Monica, who's too skinny, it made her look impoverished and uncomfortably cold. The dark Bordeaux fabric only accentuated Monica's pallor and the shoulder straps had already slipped halfway down, almost exposing her scanty bosom. Doris said to a surprised Felix, brushing her hair. I'm sorry, Sir Baron. I gave this little girl you came to sell us a little demonstration on how to please a man, 
and all of a sudden she's turning into a cripple. I'm really sorry, what should I do? Can I fix it by hitting her head? Doris's instruction, including the demonstration, was probably too intense for Monica. As a result, she seems to have tripped into the world of numbers, just like any other time. I'm sorry, Doris. I guess I was not clear enough, him? You've come to sell this orphan girl to our store, right? Well, she's a little too skinny to be suitable for most men, but I'll make sure she's ready to take on customers, so don't worry about leaving her to me. This Doris will take good care of her, no, yeah, I mean, from then on, until Felix cleared up Doris's misunderstanding, while Monica kept muttering numbers with her empty eyes endlessly. V8C5 Pro Chazareth GT Silent Witch September 1st, 2021 8 minutes you really have no flesh at all. I don't know what kind of situation you've been in, but don't worry, our store will feed you well. And even if you have a skinny body, you can still give a man a lot of pleasure if you use it right. Listen, our job is to please the customers, but they would get excited if they get a woman moaning and screaming by their hands. So you have to make yourself feel good too. For example, around here and here, also, touching your will make you feel good. After Doris thrust her hand groping into her clothes, Monica's memory was cut off from there. Kiss a soft touch on her cheek brought Monica back to herself. Ah, a cat's paw, Nero must have touched her on the cheek with his soft paw. Monica thought so, but when she looked around, she found herself neither in her mountain cabin nor in the attic, but in a room decorated with red and gold that was a sight painful to her eyes. She then turned to her left where the paw had touched her cheek and found Felix was looking at her with an indescribable look on his face. Have you come to your senses, yo? Yo 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 yo. When Monica was about to say her highness Felix presses his forefinger against her lips. Monica broke out in cold sweat and darted her gaze at her surroundings. And realized that she was now sitting on a luxurious couch leaning against Felix, with Madame Cassandra sitting across from her and Doris by her side. She then met Doris' eyes, who gave a bitter smile as she was fiddling her amber hair with her finger. Well, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to be sold to our store. That's when Monica finally noticed what she was wearing. It was Bordeaux's dress that looked like flimsy underwear, the one that Doris had forced her to wear after being dragged away earlier. A chew Monica sneezed, to which Felix took off his jacket and put it on her. Doris, Felix looked at Doris reproachfully, and Doris smiled wryly. Yet, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll lend her some warm coats. And she might need some gloves too, um, I. I just want my clothes back, that's all. Monica hurriedly stood up and shoved the jacket over her shoulder back at Felix. I'll return this to you, Achua as she sneezed. Her dress, whose shoulder straps had slipped out, fell to her feet. Since she was not wearing any kind of corset today, her dress came off easily, leaving her upper body bare. After that, she crouched down to pick up the dress, pull the shoulder straps over her shoulders then carefully checking the hem of the dress to make sure it was not dirty. Watching such a scene, Felix and Doris were dumbfounded. Comma Madame Cassandra raised her eyebrows at the unfazed Monica who put more concern over the stains on the dress rather than by the fact that her dress had just slipped off in public. What a strange girl, um. Can I have my clothes back, Doris, give her back her clothes, when Madame Cassandra pointed with her chin. Doris answered, okay, and beckoned Monica over. Monica hesitated and Doris looked troubled as she scratched her cheek. Don't worry, I just want to give you your clothes back this time, oh okay, though if you want me to teach you how to please Sir Baron, I can teach you in secret. Monica shook her head furiously, and Doris giggled happily in response. After Doris returned her clothes to her. Monica borrowed her warm fur coat and gloves. Having never worn a fur coat before, Monica was surprised at the hefty weight of the coat at first, but once she put it on, she found it to be very warm and windproof. If I had this, 
I might don't need to cover myself up with a thin blanket when I'm writing on a cold night, thought Monica as she was secretly impressed, at which Felix gave a smile. Yup, it looks good on you. You look like a little animal when you put on a coat fur. P please stop calling me little squirrel. I won't, Monica. Now, let's get going, Felix said so as he held out his left arm to Monica slightly. As Doris had taught her earlier, the proper way to handle this situation is to wrap her arms around him. However, the height difference between the petite Monica and the moderately tall Felix was too great. Monica agonized over it and pinched Felix's cuff with her fingertips. This way, she didn't have to worry about losing him. And Felix didn't rebuke at her gesture. Now, there are some stores I want to visit, but let's stroll around a bit. I think it's more fun to check out the stalls and street vendors first. Having said that, Felix started walking, taking a street that has many stalls and street vendors on. While most people would expect to find stalls selling grilled skewers and juice, many of the stalls in the entertainment district at night sell accessories. Apparently, stall owners who sell food and drink during the daytime rent their stalls to those who sell accessories during the night. Hey there, mister. Why don't you take a look at my booth? You'll find all kinds of accessories that women will love. The girls in the brothel will be very happy to have this as a souvenir. How about some pretty bracelets for the young lady over there? We also have some earrings, I guess looking a bit won't be hurt. As Felix stopped to look at the accessories on the stall, the shopkeeper was rubbing his hands. Our accessories are very special. After all, they come with the blessings of the famous magician. Oh, you have magic tools, yes. Yeah. We've got something like that here, apparently, the words blessing and charm were more popular with young people than magic tool, the shopkeeper began explaining in a plausible tone of voice that the necklace had a spell to increase one's charm and that the ring would ward off evil and so on. All of the products were shining beautifully under the light of the lantern. The shopkeeper must be well aware of the fact that it's much harder to tell the difference between a cheap product and a high quality one at night than in the daytime. None of these seem to have any effect as a magic tool. The base of the ring and the clasp were engraved with what appeared to be magic letters, but it was all complete nonsense. Perhaps Felix was aware of this but was pretending to be interested since his gaze at the accessories was devoid of any enthusiasm. In a way, he was just looking at it. As Monica looked at the accessories, she suddenly noticed a brooch that has a different design from the others. To put it bluntly, the workmanship of the base of the brooch was extremely detailed. Compared to other cute-looking accessories, the ornamentation was much more elaborate. It was made of topaz and the magic formula engraved in it was real. It has a simple defensive barrier but doesn't seem to be very detailed. The shopkeeper raised his voice when he saw Monica stared at the brooch. Oh, you have a good eye, young lady. You could tell this brooch is different from the others. It's specially made, the owner trailed off, bent forward a little then said in a lowered voice as if he was talking in secret. This brooch might be a second hand, but, hey. It was made by one of the Seven Sages, the, Jules Magician, oh, the mention of the Seven Sages made Monica wince. Standing next to her, Felix put his finger on his chin and muttered. I've heard that Emmanuel Darwin, the, Jules Magician, is a genius at making magic tools, you're very knowledgeable, mister. That's right. If you were to go through the proper channels. You could buy a house in the capital with the magic tools made by the, Jules Magician. Here, I am offering it at a special price, how about it, can I see the brooch? After Felix said this, the shopkeeper said amiably, here you go, wrapping the brooch in cloth and offering it to him. He then took the brooch and reflected the topaz in the light of the lantern. Probably confirming there was a magic formula lying inside. In the back of the magic formula, Emmanuel Darwin's name was inscribed in a very small font. No matter how one looks at it, this brooch was a counterfeit. 
The magic formula was not precise enough, and to begin with, a magic tool made by the seven sages could not have been sold in a stall like this. The only thing that bothered Monica was the way the brooch was decorated. She had seen a brooch very similar to this one before. It looks similar to Lord Cyril's brooch. Cyril Ashley, who has a constitution that makes him prone to storing mana, always wore a magic tool brooch to absorb and release the magic power within his body. Monica had directly held the brooch in her hand, so there was no way she could be wrong. Lord Cyril's brooch also had the name of the Jewels Magician engraved on it. Cyril's brooch had not been applied with a spell to prevent it from deteriorating over time. And now, the brooch in Felix's hand only has a crude defensive barrier. These two were very similar, in either with the decorations on the brooch and the quirks of the magic formula. Great, I like it. I'll take the brooch, he, that's very generous of you, mister. Thank you very much, before taking the brooch. Felix paid the price, which was an extraordinary amount of money to pay at a food stall. Monica watched Felix put the brooch away in his pocket with a hesitant feeling. Does His Highness notice that the brooch is similar to Lord Cyril's brooch? She could not tell what his thoughts were from Felix's beautiful profile, and yet, without particular reason, she kept staring at him, to which he moved his blue eyes to look at her. Hey, Monica. Are there any accessories you want? I'll buy you anything if you like it, no. I'm fine. When Monica shook her head slowly, Felix leaned down a little and looked into Monica's face. You were wearing makeup the other day at the chess tournament. It looked really good on you, would you let me give you some accessories that would look good on you at that time? Most ladies would swoon over if Felix whispered in a mellow, sweet voice. But Monica didn't feel anything from it. And now, she was thinking in her own way and said clumsily. Um. Yar. I mean eek, do you still remember at the time we met for the first time, in the old garden when you've been dropping your nuts? Yeah, when you picked up the nuts at that time. I was really, really happy, for Monica, who was just recently enrolled in the school and had no one she was familiar with. The ribbon that Lana gave her and the berries that Felix picked up were treated as treasures. She even thought it was a waste to eat them. Well, I can't really put it into words, but, even if I were to buy accessories here now, I'm sure I wouldn't be as happy as I was with the nuts at that time. I think, at Monica's crude words, Felix lowered his eyebrows slightly and smiled wistfully. I see. The lonely look on his face made Monica feel terribly sorry for him. No matter what the reason was, the fact remained that Monica had rejected Felix's goodwill. So, Monica hurriedly continued with her words. Also, I, I've only recently become interested in fashion, since I'm still a beginner, accessories are still too high on my plate. Well, accessories are for more experienced people, so I don't think I'm ready yet. As Monica frantically said this, Felix stared at her blankly, and the next moment he began giggling happily. Oh well, haha, I guess I'll leave it at that. Monica nodded briskly and inwardly patted her chest in relief. V8C6, looking for something he'd be obsessed with. As Earth GT Silent Witch September 3rd, 2021 7 minutes after passing through a straight line with accessory stalls. They came to a street lined with bustling bars. On the other side of the open door, visitors can catch a glimpse of a minstrel playing lute, men drinking and singing merrily, and women leaning over to pour a drink. As Monica was looking at that scene absent-mindedly, Felix looked at her. Are you hungry? Monica shook her head, but then Felix turned his attention to the end of the street. Then, shall we proceed straight to our destination store? There was no hesitation in Felix's steps. Apparently, he had done deciding on what kind of store he plans to drop by. Come um, what kind of store are we going to? That will be for you to see when you get there. But I'm sure you'll like it too, evidently. They had to walk a bit to get to that store. 
What kind of store it was exactly for a member of the royal family like Felix had to sneak out of his dormitory to visit, Monica wondered. Judging from Felix's behavior in the house of Madame Cassandra, he seemed to be accustomed to visiting brothels. She even saw Felix waving in a friendly manner at a young girl who was standing in front of the store when she was saying, Baron, to call him out. Baron was probably just his alias in this place. While at school he looked so well behaved, his conduct appeared unrestrained and carefree. Is that how the royal family behaving, she wondered. Even so, Monica couldn't shake the small feeling of discomfort in her heart for some reason. Yar. I mean, eek, him. Are you having fun when hanging out at night? Do I look like not having fun right now? Felix blinked his golden eyelashes, which didn't match his black wig, and tilted his head slightly. Monica hesitated just a bit, then opened her mouth. You appear to look like having fun at Monica's words. Felix closed his eyes once, then opened them. For a moment, the expression on his composed face disappeared and was replaced by a smile on his face as if he had given up on everything. Maybe you're right, Felix affirmed Monica's words vaguely, tilted his head up to stare at the sky. Even the stars at night in this brightly lit city don't look too pretty, he still squinted a little, trying to find it. Comma a friend of mine once told me, still looking up, Felix muttered quietly. I wish you could find many things you would be obsessed with that you like, you enjoy, not for anyone else, but for yourself every time Felix uttered each of those words, his white breath blended into the darkness of the night. Just like a fog. Since that day, I've been searching for all this time, whether it's things I'd love, I'd enjoy, or I'd be obsessed with. Did you find it, in this city, I did. And it was the place where we're heading to, that answer alone had proved how little interest he really had in the glamorous nightlife. Maybe strutting proudly through the exciting nightlife and spending time with beautiful women was not something he wished. Still, among that many forms of entertainment, he was looking for things he'd be obsessed about while pretending to enjoy it, even it was just for appearance. But somewhere in the back of his mind, he let out a sigh and thought, This is not what I want. Nevertheless, for the sake of his friend's wish, he was still looking for something that he'd love. Sooner or later, when I become king, I will lose my freedom. When that happens, I won't be able to hang out like this, so only this time I can be me, even if only for a short time. Monica bit her lip and wondered if she should express the doubts that were welling up in her heart. Depending on the circumstances, doubting his reasoning could be considered disrespectful, and ending up with her head decapitated would be a natural thing. Still, Monica wanted to know the truth. What was Felix really thinking? Comma do you still want to be a king, even though you know you'll lose your freedom, do I want to be a king? I guess you're a bit wrong about that. Felix shook his head slowly then looked down at Monica. The expression drained from his composed face, and his jewel-like blue eyes lost their sparkle. I have to be king, yes, being born into royalty and aiming to be king is a natural thing, a feeling that Monica will never understand. The topic of the succession to the throne is a very delicate one. So having someone doubt him might lead him to get an insult saying that he's not fit to be a king. That's why Monica bowed deeply to Felix. I am sorry for asking you such a rude question, I don't mind. Honestly, I'm glad you're taking an interest in me. Especially since you've been surprisingly indifferent to me, UEH. Monica yelped out unconsciously like a frog that had been hit by a carriage. What Felix said has a point. Although Monica had some consciousness for Felix, it was as a target for her protection, not for the individual himself. At most, he had an amazing body with a golden ratio in her mind. As Monica lingered in silence, breaking out in a cold sweat, Felix put his finger on her chin to lift her downcast face. If you feel sorry for yourself, then you should tell me about yourself next, eh about myself. There are so many secrets surrounding you, Monica's face tensed up. 
Her biggest secret was the fact that she's Monica Everett, the Seven Sages, the Silent Witch. She thought she had managed to keep it hidden until now, but perhaps Felix had figured out Monica's true identity? Like you would appear in the place wherever I present. Entering the secret old garden where you can't enter without a key, witnessing my escape from the dormitory, and now, here you are. The reason Monica was able to enter the closed doll garden was because of her spell. The reason she witnessed Felix's sneaking out of the dormitory at that exact moment was because of Nero's help. And now, the fact that Monica was standing here was because of Lynn's help. And all of them were things that can't be done by an ordinary student. Felix took Monica's pale hand and placed it on his own neck. And just like he had warmed her hand earlier. He tried to warm Monica's hand, when I realized you were following me, the first thing that crossed my mind was you were an assassin who wanted to kill me. But when I put your hand on my neck like this earlier, your fingers never tried to strangle me. After all, anyone who seeks an opportunity to assassinate someone would think of this as a chance. Monica paled immediately, realized Felix was testing Monica's response at the time. Since you didn't do anything because it was a crowded road, then how about now when we're on a deserted road? If you were planning to assassin me, you can do it now, whether to strangle or cut my neck, I, I would never dare. Monica quickly denied it, and Felix simply nodded, yeah, I know, but, to her disappointment, he said plainly, you're not an assassin. If you were, you'd have killed me by now, whatever your purpose is. You are far too suspicious to have been hired by anyone. I don't think you're an enemy, but you're too unreliable to be an ally. That's why I've been treated you as an interesting pet, Pepe. Pay pay. Pet, looking at the flabbergasted Monica, Felix chuckled mischievously. Now we're just fellow night outers sharing the same secret. He then extended his index finger and flicked it against Monica's forehead. And did you realize it? You could have made a good deal in this situation, like if you didn't want me to find out that you're night out, you do what I said, it's just that, well, TT there's nothing in particular that I want from you, after winning the chess match from Felix, she had requested him to stop calling her little squirrel. But, since Monica had given up and let him call her by her name, there was nothing more she wants from Felix. Comma, I don't have anything that I want from you, nor I expect anything from you, really, yeah, I've known that much after spending together in the past few months. That you never expect anything from me, Felix turned his back on Monica and walked a few steps ahead of her. Then, without looking back at Monica, he suddenly said, Well, that might be comforting but also a bit lonely. Felix started walking slowly while Monica followed behind quickly. Feeling bad about standing next to Felix, so she walked diagonally behind him with her head hanging down, but he entangled his own fingers with hers before starting to walk again. And to Monica's confusion, Felix said, I told you before, didn't I? I'm looking for things that I like and enjoy. I do enjoy playing you out so I'm not going to pry into who you are. So why don't you give me more attention, huh? Playing, me, oh, let me correct that. I'm enjoying playing out with you, you just said playing me. Me, Felix dragged Monica, who was making muffled grunting noises, by hand, then looked ahead before giving a particularly cheerful voice. Look, the store we're looking for is in sight. Even though she knew she was being deceived, she looked the way he pointed out and saw an old brick house. Hanging from the door was a small lamp and a wooden plaque, with the orange light from the lamp illuminating the words on it. And engraved in the unadorned plate were the words Porter Antiquarian Bookstore in rugged letters. Now, Monica. Let me tell you something. This store is my favorite place. V8C7. The Second Prince is Obsessed with Azareth GT Silent Witch September 6, 2021 7 minutes creak after he opened the door opened, the side of a row of bookshelves that were evenly spaced within the store appeared before her. 
Each gap between the bookshelves was so narrow that one person could barely pass through. Without hesitation, Felix made his way between the second and third bookshelves from the right. And Monica hesitantly followed behind him. Monica could smell the unique scent of old paper and insect repellent herbs in the store. This was different from the night city filled with the scent of makeup, perfume, and alcohol, which eased Monica's mind a little. Glancing at the books on the shelves as she walked, she noticed the books were crammed with academic books related to medicinal herbs and medicine. This was not Monica's area of expertise, but she could somehow tell that the books were kept in good condition. Eventually, after passing through a narrow gap in the bookshelves, they arrived at a small counter where a man was sitting, riding by the light of a lamp. The man with brown skin and stiff black hair was wearing a pair of glasses, and maybe with some foreign blood flowing in his veins. His almond-shaped eyes and deeply chiseled face made it difficult to tell his age. He could be in his twenties or forties. Perhaps because of the creaking sound from walking, it had made him notice their presence, but the man didn't raise his head up from his papers. Good evening, Porter, Felix called out to him, but the shopkeeper didn't raise his head up. He seemed so engrossed with his writings as if he could not hear the voices of his customers. Eventually, he stopped his writing, putting back his quill pen into the ink pot then opened his mouth. Evening, he said as he nodded briskly before continuing with his writings. From the looks of it, he seemed to be writing some manuscript instead of ledgers. The eccentric attitude of the man, who refused to change his curt attitude even towards the obviously aristocratic Felix, vaguely reminded her of Claudia. Monica, this is Porter. He's the owner of this store and a novelist. He spends about half the year traveling from place to place stocking books. It's lucky we met him today, that's right. I just got back from stocking up the other day. Got a few books you might enjoy, really, Felix spoke in a lively voice with a lit up face. Porter pointed with his quill to a bookshelf by the wall where the books that Felix would enjoy were. After heading to the corner where Porter pointed, Felix picked up the book before letting out an O, oh, word in a cheerful voice. Back issues of Minerva Spring. Monica turned pale when she saw the magazine Felix had picked up. Every six months, the Magician Training Institute Minerva publishes a magazine that summarizes the research results of its students and professors called Minerva Spring. Naturally, as a scholarship student, Monica's thesis has been published several times. WWWWWY, of all the book, His Highness was picking up that book? while 80% of the articles in the magazine were related to magic. The other 20% consisted of the professor's essays and the student council's trivia on how to live a comfortable life as a student. Maybe His Highness is a big fan of the professor's essays on hair growth. It must be, it has to be. Or maybe he's just looking for some wisdom on how to live a comfortable student life. I can't think of any other reason. As Monica was thinking this to herself, Felix, who was flipping through a magazine, said with a childlike manner as his eyes gleamed. There's a, Silent Witch, SSA in it, DD did he just says SS Island Witch? S Silent Witch? What? I must have misheard it. I'm sure. While Monica looked like falling apart at any moment, Porter stopped moving his pen and opened his mouth. All three of the books there have articles regarding the Witch of Silence in them. Also, the most recent one contains her recent contribution, Porter. You did a splendid job, Felix's voice was clearly agitated. Yes, he was excited. Monica had never seen Felix's eyes shine so brightly in these past months. While Monica was stunned, unable to take in the various shocks, Felix laughed, slightly embarrassed. Are you surprised? I'm actually interested in magic, um, but you said you didn't take any basic magic classes, because of some circumstances, my grandfather forbade me to study anything related to magic, Felix's words came as a surprise to Monica. Granted, 
A royal family member is demanded to have more skills in politics and languages than in magic. Nevertheless, many members of the royal family of the Riddell Kingdom have a talent for magic, and there have been several excellent magicians in the royal family in the past generations. The current king is also said to be an earth magician, and Felix's brother, the first prince, was a graduate of Minerva. It just didn't make any sense to Monica why they would go to the trouble of banning them to study magic. To Monica's bewilderment, he continued to flip through the magazine, without hiding his good mood. A grimoire is usually expensive and thick in size, right? Moreover, depending on the item, you need to have qualifications to read or buy it. That's why sneaking them in and hiding them in my room is quite difficult, so... He decided to use Minerva Spring, which was relatively easy to get hold of. However, the papers published in Minerva Spring were strictly selected. To understand them, one needs to have the knowledge of an intermediate level magician. How much knowledge does Felix possess about magic? While Monica was wondering about this, Felix was still flipping through Minerva Spring and seemed to be more talkative than usual. I have read the previous article on the coordinates of the Silent Witch's Wide Range Magic Formula, and it was brilliant. I can't believe she wrote that as a student. To put it simply, by not incorporating the tracking technique into the Wide Range Magic Formula, the spell can be activated with a pinpoint in the exact target location to increase the accuracy. Because her calculation method to pinpoint the exact coordination is so groundbreaking, it had reduced so many steps in creating the magic formula, Monica was paying attentively with a stiff face. Well, yes, that's right, the current tracking formula has many shortcomings, so before improving the tracking formula, I wanted to make a compact wide range magic formula without incorporating the tracking formula first. Wow. He really understands it. While Monica was flinching, Felix looked at her before suddenly realizing his embarrassing behavior. Forgive me, I'm actually a big fan of her. When it comes to the silent witch, I can't help but be rather talkative, F fan, although she's the youngest among the seven sages and doesn't have as many flashy accomplishments as the barrier magician. I think she's made a significant contribution to the field of basic magic in our Riddle Kingdom. In addition, her no chant magic is, well, it was very beautiful, as Felix uttered the last word, he looked somewhat enraptured. But Monica was no longer concerned with that. Has he ever seen me use no chanting magic I I E I E I I When exactly has he seen me? Doesn't this mean that, he knows who I am? There's no way, right? I have never seen such beautiful magic in my life. Oh, I wish I could see that no chant magic with my own eyes again, as Felix let out a wistful exhale, Porter muttered to himself. You know, I'm currently writing a scene in my new novel about a foolish man who falls in love with a stage actress. And Abram, a friend of the main protagonist Bartholomew, who's in love with the stage actress Catherine says, Oh, I'd like to see her play again with my own eyes, and your expression was exactly like that. Well, you might be right, Porter. Yeah, maybe that's what they call first love, F first love. Finally, Monica's whole body convulsed. Maybe because she was too shocked, her head and her facial muscles were not working properly. What should I do? I want to escape to the world of numbers. Surprised? This is what I am obsessed with right now, you um. Why you're. I mean eek, have you ever met with, silent witch, when Monica asked with an ashen look on her face, Felix nodded, his cheeks rosy with fascination. Yet, yeah, at the inauguration and New Year's ceremonies. But she always wears a hooded robe and few people know her real face. She always leaves the party after the ceremony so I never had a chance to talk to her nor seen her face in person. Thank God, he hasn't found out who I am yet. Monica patted her chest. But it was too early to be relieved. But if I become the king, I can meet her whenever I want, so it's not a problem. 
The seven sages are the king's advisors. After all, it was a big problem. Once he became king, he'd be able to talk to her directly, maybe even get a glimpse of her true face. You should definitely not do that. Please don't do that. I'm not the kind of person who can be consulted by the king. In fact, I apologize for being the silent witch. I'm sorry. I, 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 Monica finally turned over, clutching her stomach. What should I do? I feel like I'm going to throw up everything I ate at the Star Oracle Witch's mansion here. For the time being, Monica made a firm vow to keep her attendance at the ceremony to a minimum and to never take her hood off. V8C8, Bookworthiness Azareth GT Silent Witch September 10, 2021 8 minutes Monica looked around the store while Felix was happily rifling through the back issues of Minerva Spring. His shocking statement made her stomach hurt a little, but the antiquarian bookstore was certainly something that made Monica's heart skip a beat. They have everything from so-called old books that have been published relatively recently to what are called old books from a time when printing and bookbinding technologies were not yet developed. A quick look around the store showed that about half of the books on the shelves were entertainment novels for the general public while the other half were practical and academic books. There were also some rare books that were out of print. Though she wanted to read some magic books, as expected, if she did it in front of Felix, he would discover that she could use magic. As she walked around the bookshelves looking for a math book, she stopped in front of a certain shelf. There was a shelf of medical books and biology books. Feeling there is some familiar name which had made her curious. Calming her heart, which was beating faster than usual, Monica slowly followed the words on the bookshelf. Comma a certain book caught Monica's eyes. A book that had been published five years ago, then banned for its publication before they were withdrawn and burned all of them. Magical Properties Deciphered from Genetic Traits by Benedict Rain. Monica reached the book as if being drawn to the book before picking it up and flipping the cover with trembling fingers. Like she had heard many times before, it had started with a sentence. Comma human body is made up of a vast array of numbers. The contents of the book were difficult to understand without knowledge of both biology and magic, and Monica, who had not majored in biology, could only understand about half of the content. Still. Monica was able to remember the numbers in the charts and graphs. Comma 18,473,726, 385, 20,985.726, 29,405.84739, 235, 2,108,877, 25, that book for its every page had been burned to ashes, was the proof of her father's life after he was executed as a heretic. And now, the book which she had burned into her eyes, was now in perfect form before her. Monica hugged the book to her chest and rushed over to Porter. E excuse me. I'd like, to buy, this book, please. Porter lifted his head from his manuscript paper and looked at Monica. Then he looked at the title of the book and his eyes behind his glasses widened slightly. My friend has entrusted that book to me. And I don't have any intention of charging a low price for it. Monica was surprised to learn that this man, Porter, was a friend of her late father. But since she couldn't bring up the topic of her father in front of Felix, she forced down her agitation before leaning forward to ask, H how much? Porter held up two fingers and held them out in front of Monica. The price for this kind of specialist book was about one silver coin. But he was asking for two silver coins, doubled of that price. Two gold coins, Monica gulped unconsciously. Two gold coins are enough for a commoner who lives a modest life to live for a while without working. And she, who's been working as a seven sage, had earned enough saving to set up a house in the royal capital. But since she rarely does any shopping, doesn't usually carry around a lot of money, let alone bringing two gold coins. You um, could you keep this book for me? I will definitely come back to pay you someday, so, 
How many years does it take a child like you to earn two gold coins? Grown Monica could pay two gold coins if she wanted to. But, if she says that here, it would leave a chance of her true identity will be revealed. While Monica was desperately trying to think of a way to ask for a reservation, Felix, who had been standing next to Monica, placed two gold coins on the counter. Will this be enough? Monica couldn't help but look up at Felix with white eyes. I, I couldn't accept this. I, I couldn't let you pay this for me, e especially with this much money. Think of it as payment for keeping your mouth shut about my nightlife. Felix then bent down a little and looked into Monica's face. I know you wouldn't be happy about me giving you accessories, but, you want to get this book? No, well, that's, but two gold coins. I don't know what the book is worth, but to you, it's worth a lot, isn't it? The moment Monica heard those words, tears spilled from her eyes. Everybody had scoffed at her father's research, at the books that were being burned, as worthless. They trampled them, tore them to pieces, and threw them into the flames. No matter how much Monica claimed its value, no one listened to her, in fact. She was not allowed to even try to tell them its value, so her uncle beat her. He beat her again, and again, and again, telling her not to say unnecessary things. So insistently until Monica lost her words. Felix doesn't know the value of this book. Nevertheless, he acknowledged and allowed Monica to cherish this book. After having thought all of it, Monica was so happy when she heard those words. Nodding her head over and over again as her tears streaming down her face. It was a book that was worth that much to her. It was proof of her father's life. Felix bent down and wiped the tears from Monica's eyes with his fingertips. Well, I didn't mean to make you cry, but won't you smile for me? Felix gently lowered his eyelids when Monica forced her crying face to smile. Porter snatched up a gold coin with a sour look. I did receive two gold pieces, then stashed the gold coins in a small safe before giving the book to Monica. Her father's book was worth two gold coins. Now this book is yours. Monica wiped her tears with the sleeve of her dress and received the book with trembling hands. Holding her father's book to her chest, she bowed deeply to Porter and Felix. Thank you so much for making this book, worth so much. Shouldn't the person who's being charged be angry that it's a scam? To Porter's dismay, Monica shook her head desperately her father would not have been interested in its reputation or its value which other people put on it, but Monica was still much happier than if his books had been sold at a low price. Felix gently looked at Monica, who was holding the book to her chest, crying with her nose all red, but still smiling happily with eyes that seemed to be looking at something nostalgic. There was a big party being held in the house of Madame Cassandra. The reason for this was because a certain wealthy guest had donated a large sum of money to the store. And the said guest was staying with a certain girl in the most magnificent room. Though he said he didn't need to bring in the store girl, it would be a disservice to the house of Madame Cassandra if she didn't provide any service. Doris. The most popular woman in the store, left the party and knocked on the door of her guest's room with a light snack, a fruit platter, and a bottle of the finest liquor she could find. In case they were having a good time in bed, I could mix it up with them. But if the childish looking girl isn't doing well, this big sis Doris could teach her a thing or two. Doris opened the door with these thoughts in mind and involuntarily blinked her eyes. Her guests were seated on a sofa in the most luxurious room of the restaurant, both of them reading quietly. Wait, wait, wait. How can a pair of young men and women stay up this late reading together? A healthy man and a healthy woman should have done more than this. Oh, Doris. Could you leave the drinks there for me? I am getting at the good part. Doris had no idea what the real name of the man who was a regular at the store was. He called himself a baron, but she had a hunch that he must have been of higher status than that. What was important to Doris was not who the man was, but how he behaved in bed and how much money he paid. In both of these senses, this baron was perfect. 
He did not look down on the girls, he did not act arrogant or violent, and he was good in bed. In addition, his good looks and well money have caused more than a few of the girls to fall in love with him. And the said Baron who knows how to have fun at night, despite the fact that he's alone with a young girl, he's reading a book together. Hey, little girl. Are you okay with that? It's like you're implying Sir Baron is unattractive. Well, this book proposes that genetic traits are small particles called genetic particles, which are like the blueprint of a person, and depending on these particles, you can determine the amount of magic power and special attributes. I didn't mean that kind of topic. Doris poured the liquor she had brought into an empty glass and pushed it to Monica. Here, drink this. Oh. Okay, Monica tipped the glass as offered. After concentrating too much on her reading, she was thirsty and drank half of the glass in one gulp. Doris also poured some liquor into Sir Baron's glass, and he took a light sip before closing his eyes. Hmm, this is a good wine, isn't it? They're very good. Madam told me to bring you some, M.M. Reading a book accompanied by a good wine is not so bad. This isn't what wine is for. Just as Doris yelled at him, Monica closed her book and stood up silently. Her eyes were somewhat vacant and unfocused. Come Monica, Monica's mouth moved in a squirming motion when the Baron put down his magazine and called out to her. Come you you you, it's hot, said Monica as she abruptly took off the clothes she was wearing. It was an instantaneous event that the two did not have time to stop it. Her eccentricities did not end there. As she approached Sir Baron with a wobbly gait, she grabbed his hand and flattened his palm with her fingers. Comma there's no paw, there are more places to touch when it comes to pleasing a gentleman. Why the palm? What's more, she made a strange statement about the paw. It doesn't make any sense. Thought Doris in a daze as Monica pressed Sir Baron's hand against her own cheek before lowering her eyebrows sadly and muttered, There's no paw. Off. Monica sniffed sadly, tottered over to the bed, and curled up on it in her underwear as if she was an animal. And like that, she left mysterious words like, I want to be a cat, and fell asleep. Doris turned her head slowly to look at Sir Baron. Sir Baron, did you just pick up a cat well, that was the first time I saw it too. I'm honestly surprised, what did she mean by the paw, anyway, I wonder. When they returned their attention to the bed, they saw Monica was munching in her sleep, looking very happy indeed. V8C9, let's put a ribbon on the kitten. As Earth GT tired immortal September 12, 2021 8 minutes she felt like she was having a pleasant dream. While the content of the dream is hard to remember, she did remember her father smiling calmly at her. Comma Dad, Monica who had been sleeping in a blissful dream, shivered from the chilly weather. The early morning wind when the winter approaching penetrated even through the slightest crack in the blanket. Crawling into the depths of the blanket, she noticed that there was something warm nearby and unconsciously approached it. When she put her body against it, it felt warm and cozy. But he does seem rather large for Nero, him. I don't know what it is, but it's warm. So it's okay, thought Monica, abandoning her thoughts and falling asleep. A soft hand stroked Monica's hair, and then something softly touched her cheek. Monica was familiar with this pleasant feeling. Comma paw. Good morning, Nero, Nero. Monica was instantly arisen by a voice that came from close by. Opening her eyes to the limit to stare at the voice revealed jewel-like blue eyes staring tenderly at Monica. Monica squealed inaudibly and rolled off the bed, which followed by dynamic rumbles after. As she crawled on the floor, the prophecy of Mary Harvey, the star oracle witch, flashed through her mind. Comma I can foresee your love life is on a roll right now. Moreover, you might end up spending a passionate night with a nice gentleman could this be the kind of thing where maybe, just maybe. I have crossed the line thought Monica as she rubbed her forehead on the floor before saying in a shaky voice. Eggs, eggs, will I be executed, 
Felix chuckled at the deathly look on Monica's face as he raised his upper body on the bed. He's not wearing anything on his upper body, completely naked. She had snuggled against that chest, after all. Having her head chopped off wasn't something she could complain about. Do you think I'd kill a cute little kitten just because it got into my bunk, eh? A cat, Monica brought her face up and glanced around. Yet, she could not see any cat in the room. Where's the cat thought Monica as she tilted her head, at which Felix looked with amusement. You drank a glass of wine last night, then all of a sudden you took off your clothes and fell asleep. Monica finally realized why she was in her underwear. No wonder she felt so cold. At least, she didn't cross the line and breathed a sigh of relief at that fact. Don't you feel cold in that outfit? Oh, yes. I apologize for showing you something embarrassing. I'll get changed soon. Huh. Feeling a strange sensation around her neck, she touched it with her fingers and felt in chains that felt like a necklace. As she lowered her gaze, she saw a small green stone glittering on her chest, reflecting the morning sun. Monica gave Felix a puzzled look to which Felix rested his cheek on his propped up knee and narrowed his eyes. It resembles the color of your eyes, after all. They look good together, this is, you told me you wouldn't be as happy as that time if I gave you jewelry. Monica lowered her eyebrows and gave a small nod. But looking at her response, Felix felt a bit lonely before giving her a sad smile. Monica silently studied the necklace. Hanging at the end of the thin golden chain was an olive green stone, slightly larger than her pinky nail. The bright green color with a slight golden tinge was probably peridot. The modest and cute design must have been chosen with her personality in mind. Nevertheless, she, not accustomed to accessories, looked up at Felix in confusion. Um, I know you've been paying for this room, and you also paid for the book for a huge sum, but I can't receive any more than this. Monica would feel bad if she received any gifts more than that. So she reached for the clasp on the back of her neck to take the necklace off and return it to him. But not familiar with this kind of thing, she didn't know how to take it off. As she clumsily moved her fingers, Felix got off the bed to hold her hand from above. But, the moment he touched her, Monica's body tensed up. Growing up with her father's personal medical books and models of the human body, the idea of seeing or being seen naked was not a concern for Monica. But being touched by people is scary. Recalling how unreasonably violent her uncle was, her body unconsciously tensed up. Felix brought Monica's hand down from where it was trying to remove her necklace when she was shivering for a different reason than the cold. After which, he ran his fingertips along the gold chain that adorned Monica's neck. I know you were thinking that this necklace is too early for you. But I didn't give this necklace to you. I'm giving it to you for my own satisfaction, for my own sake, unsure of what Felix was trying to say. Monica looked up at him with a confused look in her eyes. Felix gave a slightly bitter smile and plucked the peridot with his fingertips, pulling it lightly. The thin chain dug into Monica's skin just a little. A tangible gift, especially a wearable one, is a good way to hold people's hearts together, right? Holding people's hearts together with things. That's a very proud aristocrat thing to say. So why does this person look so lonely? Felix's exquisite fingertips lifted the peridot. His shapely lips drop a kiss to the olive green jewel which is much like Monica's eyes. I want you to remember these memories. The memories of, Eeg, who's been hanging out with you. At first glance, the scene would have looked like a man and a woman who had spent the night together vowing their love to each other in the morning light, with their clothes in disarray. However, as she gazed at Felix's long eyelashes in front of her, Monica was quietly thinking. Comma I will probably never be able to hang out at night with, Eeg, again. That's why Felix gave Monica so many gifts, to the point of being excessive. To preserve as many memories as possible of the young man named Eeg. Once Felix took his hand away from the peridot, 
The beautiful olive green reflected against Monica's pale skin. The peridot shone beautifully in the colors of the meadow as the morning sun glimmered through the window. Her eyes, which usually looked brownish, likewise turned a little darker green in the bright light. Peridot glows beautifully, even in the slightest light on a dark night. I'm sure I can find you easily if you wear it. The usual Monica would have thought you don't have to find me to Felix with a pale face. But right now, she doesn't want to hurt Teague by denying him. So, she tried her best to choose her words, despite her clumsiness. Come week, hmm, I had a lot of fun hanging out at night with you, even though there were a lot of surprises, yeah, in the future. The likelihood that Monica will wear a peridot necklace herself is not likely to happen. Still, for now, she stopped reaching for the clasp, feeling that Eeg would be sad if she took the necklace off. Eventually, Monica got up and picked up her clothes, which were folded on the couch. She was strangely happy to see that the book she had bought yesterday was also neatly placed on top of her clothes, away from the drinks and food. As Monica was getting dressed, Felix suddenly remembered to look at Monica's back and said, Actually, I've been wondering since yesterday, how did you get that old scar on your back? There's still some scars remains, to a certain extent. Especially around the shoulders. Fortunately, there was a large dressing table inside the room, so Monica twisted around a little to look at her own back. Sure enough, there were some bruises and raised skin marks on her back. All of them are remnants of the time when she was beaten by her uncle. Was that done by Count Kerbeck's family? Monica shook her head in alarm at Felix's words. Her current status is that of a nuisance to Count Kerbeck's family, but it would be dishonorable to accuse Isabel and the others of abusing her. Not at all. Count Kerbeck's family has been treating me really, really well. This scar was from a long time ago. Have you ever wanted to make that scar disappear cleanly? No, not really. Monica meant this from the bottom of her heart. Besides, the scars weren't anything that would hurt her now, and having an old scar on her back wouldn't interfere with her work. She lacked the sensitivity to regard scars as ugly, but for Felix, the presence of scars on a woman's body was not something to be overlooked. Suddenly, Monica noticed. Felix's body also had a scar on his side that looked like it had been stabbed by something. His perfectly proportioned body was beautifully smooth, which made the scar on his waist stand out even more. That scar on your waist, do you want to remove it? Felix looked down at his own scars and shook his head gently when Monica asked timidly. Comma it's okay. This is the scar required for me, she didn't know what he meant by that but she felt that she shouldn't pry too deeply into the matter, so she just kept quiet and finished getting dressed. The girls of the house of Madame Cassandra gave Felix and Monica a grand send-off. Doris, in particular, after kissing Felix passionately on the cheek, beckoned Monica over to listen. If you have any trouble eating, you can always come to our house. We'll take care of you, T thanks, also. Sir Baron's weakness is, you get it. Keep that in mind, Monica felt like remembering that would not be helpful at all. So she just smiled vaguely and nodded back at Doris. After leaving the house of Madame Cassandra, Felix made his way to the place where the carriage was parked. Although he had offered to give Monica a ride in his carriage, she had politely declined. You sure you can make it to the meeting before noon? Why yes. I have my way, so, after all, with Lynn's help, they can easily fly away with wind magic. It's much faster than riding in a carriage back to the academy. Thank you very much for everything, as Monica bowed her head, hugging the book that had been bought for her, Felix gave her the same gentle, friendly smile that he always gave her at school. A smile which different from mischievous of Eek, but a smile of royalty that adored by everyone. The time she's been spending with Eeg was over. Now, the man before her was not the Felix Ark Riddle like before, but the second prince of this country. Noble and distant. I'll see you then, yes, the carriage that Felix had boarded started to roll. 
Monica remained there watching the carriage go by until she could no longer hear the sound of its wheels. Eventually, a small yellow bird landed on Monica's shoulder. It was Lynn, a contracted spirit of Lewis Miller. You have worked hard guarding the second prince, Miss, Silent Witch. Why yeah, could I call that protection? Wondered Monica as she smiled dryly inwardly. Since she had forgotten about the escort in the process, got swept up by Eek, and then became absorbed in reading. She was having fun. The book in her arms and the peridot necklace, even if they were just his whims, was surely unforgettable memories for Monica. As Monica was thinking about this, Lynn, in her little bird form, moved up to Monica's ear and whispered in her ear. I'd like to take you to the academy now, but before that, I have some bad news, eh? Lynn told the news to the tense Monica. The infiltrated assassin in the chess tournament who'd been captured was V8C10, Yuan and Heidi Azareth GT Silent Witch September 14, 2021 8 minutes a self-poisoning, the mutter blew us in a low voice prompting the head warden sitting across from him to nod once with a pale face. What awaited Lewis Miller when he returned home after leaving the mansion of the Star Oracle Witch, was a report of the fake Pittman, the assassin who broke into Serendia Academy, which had killed himself with a hidden poison. Thus, even after having just returned home in the middle of the night, he flew with his flight spell to the prison and summoned the person in charge. After a bit of choking up of the guard who was speaking nonsense telling Lewis to come back again in the morning since it's night now. The middle-aged man who served as the chief warden of this prison trembled pathetically the moment he heard the seven sages had called him, which couldn't help but prompted him to answer Lewis' question honestly. When did you find the body? Earlier this afternoon, a patrol guard found him. You said it was a self-poisoning. But did you find any eyewitness who saw him took the poison, and no, sir. The cell across from it just happened to be empty, have any of the other prisoners noticed anything unusual, there's no sign of it either, nodding his head with a hum, Lewis recalled in his mind the structure of the prison he had checked before coming here. Instead of facing each other, the cells in this prison were built to be next to each other making it difficult for prisoners to check on each other's cell conditions. When you imprisoned that man, did you not check his belongings? The warden's face turned beet red at Lewis' question, causing him to refute in a desperate manner with his spits flying over. W we did. We have checked it very carefully. That man certainly didn't bring any poison with him, but in reality, he was dead. W well. I. Lewis considered a few cases in his mind before reaching two major possibilities. Either the imprisoned man was carrying poison by some means and committed suicide, or someone killed him to keep his mouth shut. Thinking that the latter seemed more likely, he asked the chief warden to show him the man's body. The chief warden was getting nervous, but he still led Lewis to the basement. Apparently, they were using one of the rooms in the basement as a morgue for the body. The body lying on the floor was that of a man in his mid-twenties. He was told that his appearance, which resembled that of my nervous teacher, Eugene Pittman, was not the result of any makeup or disguise. That was confirmed when he was captured. Looking at the way he dressed in his prison uniform was pretty crude. It bothered Lois. Chief Warden. Did you take off his clothes right after he died? And no, not particularly, but I believe it remains exactly as it was when it was first discovered. Then it's strange, thought Lewis, furrowing his brow. The way the prisoner's clothes were worn was a little too crude. The front and back of his pants were reversed, and it didn't reach all the way up to his waist. It looks as if someone put it on him after he died. Suddenly. A possibility crossed his mind, and Lewis thoroughly examined the condition of the body. He had some knowledge of autopsy, but admittedly, with the level of medicine in this country, it was difficult to determine the exact time of death. Comma still, distinguishing between someone who has been dead for half a day and someone who has been dead for a few days was something he could do. Chief Warden, how was the real Eugene Pittman murdered? 
According to his statement, he took advantage of the fact that Eugene Pittman was on his way to Serendia Academy to participate in the chess tournament, and killed him by drowning him with water magic. He then stripped him and dumped him in the river. So, you still haven't found the body of the real Eugene Pittman. After seeing the chief warden nod, Lewis was convinced. The real Pittman was killed by drowning. That's the only information available to them from the killer's statement. What if Pittman had really been killed in a different way? Such as poisoning. Lewis looked down at the body in front of him with a bitter look on his face. I am pretty sure that the cause of death of this body is poisoning. However, this is not a body that has been dead for half a day. This is the actual Eugene Pittman. What? I presume they were using ice magic to prevent the body from decomposing, turning his gleaming, razor-sharp eyes on the uncomprehending warden. Lewis posed a single question. Have there been any outsiders in or out of the building today? And now, that you mention it, there's a traitor who delivers food to prisoners. That traitor must be his accomplice. He she probably carried the real Pittman's body into the cell faked the fake Pittman suicide, before letting him out. A covered wagon was moving down the street, despite the fact that it was late at night. A young girl with short black hair was seated in the driver's seat wearing a hooded cloak. Under the cloak was a fresh face with no makeup and eyebrows set in a dignified expression. Just then, a young man emerged from the wagon behind her. He gave the impression of calm, unreliable and gentle, it was Eugene Pittman, manner of his teacher, nay, it was the man who stole his face. Keeping her gaze forward, the woman opened her mouth. Yuan, please remain inside. There may be people who are already aware of your escape, come on, Heidi, don't be so uptight. How about this, then, the man called Yuan laughed in a sweet voice like burnt honey and covered his face with his hand. Then. As his fingers dug into the skin, the face that resembled Eugene Pittman contorted like squishy clay. It might look like some clay was pasted onto the skin and then kneaded. However, if you look closely, you can see that this was not the case. The skin itself has been transformed into a clay-like substance. Despite the nauseating and horrifying scene that was unfolding nearby, Heidi did not change her expression. To her. This scene was nothing to be surprised about. Here, how about this, when Yuan put his hand off, his face looked exactly like Felix Ark Riddle, the second prince of the Riddle Kingdom, only with different colored hair and eyes. Heidi shifted her focus to stare at Yuan's face with one eye, then returned her gaze to the front. Yuan, please stop joking around, okay, okay. Heidi, for someone so cute. You can't take a joke. I'm sorry. Heidi lowered her dignified eyebrows with a slight shrug and lowered her head. She has an earnest personality that makes her blame herself for even the most trivial of things. Yuan gave an exasperated, goodness, and hugged Heidi from behind. I'm not angry with you, okay? I do feel so lucky to have such a good ally like you. It's all thanks to you that I was able to escape from prison like this. Thank you, Yuan then kissed the back of Heidi's head with a smooch sound. Yuan was an excellent assassin who could infiltrate various places by manipulating his face at will, but all this was possible only with the support of Heidi. They poisoned the real Eugene Pittman and preserved his body with ice magic to prevent it from decomposing. Then, after Yuan had safely completed his mission at Serendia Academy, he would fake his own suicide at a suitable place and have the preserved body found. That was the original plan. However, the boy, Barney or whoever he was, saw through him and caused Yuan to be apprehended. So he changed his plan and asked Heidi to sneak into the prison to replace Yuan's body with Pittman's. I was so close this time, oh, dear, all that stress could ruin my skin. Shall we return to the Empire after a short break in the hideout? Yuan shook his head as he stayed in the position of hugging Heidi from behind. No, my work is not done yet. I plan to infiltrate at the Serendia Academy's school festival one more time. With that said, 
Yoran squinted his eyes like a snake and licked his lips with a thin tongue. Still, there is something that's bothering me. You mean the invisible magicians who defeated you, right? You unclosed his eyes and recalled the moment when he was knocked down. Another female student arrived when he tried to silence Barney Jones, manner of a student who discovered his true identity. Since it would be troublesome if that she screamed, he trapped her in a water ball barrier. For some reason, the water ball barrier was broken. And somehow, he was crushed by wind magic and was stunned by lightning magic afterward. But he didn't see anyone in the room who was reciting any spell. At that time, he had assumed that there were magicians hiding somewhere and were using remote spells to attack Yuan. But what if it was not the case? The water ball barrier that Yuan had set up felt as if it had been destroyed from the inside. What's more, the girl who looked so weak couldn't possibly destroy the barrier with her bare hands. If she wanted to destroy it from the inside, it would be appropriate to interfere with it with some spell. Since inside the water ball barrier was filled with water, she shouldn't able to recite a spell but... Was she carrying some kind of magic tool? Hmm, she never showed any signs of using any tools. With a face that resembled Felix's, Yoran squinted his eyes and examined the situation over and over again. The more he examined it, the more he came to one conclusion. In other words, there is something about that girl, Monica Norton. If he were going to infiltrate Serendia Academy's school festival, that girl would probably be his biggest obstacle. In response to this premonition, Yuan's body trembled and his lips lifted into a crescent moon smile. With a throaty, sweet voice, he seemed to be enjoying himself from the bottom of his heart. You hoo hoo, ah ha 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 ha, you look so happy. Yuan, of course I'm so happy. I'm so thrilled to look forward to this. I mean, I can smell stimulating secrets from it. Yuan hugged Heidi from behind and nuzzled his face into her dark hair, letting out a chuckle. Then, like a cat approaching its prey, he licked his lips with a smile. My job is to expose people's secrets. Whether it's Felix Ark Riddle's secrets or Monica Norton's secrets, I'll expose them all. Yuan, there's a hard object hitting my waist. I love the look on their face when their secret is revealed. How wonderfully arousing. Especially when their face is beautifully twisted into a crumpled mess. It's like a virgin girl crying and begging please don't expose me. Please don't expose me with her clothes ripped off. Yuan, there's a hard object hitting my waist. When we get to the hideout, will you keep me company? Sure, if that's what you want. Yuan. V8C11, Amber Whereabout Azeroth GT Silent Witch September 17, 2021 8 minutes when Monica returned to the attic of the girl's dormitory with Lynn's super fast flying magic, Nero was wedged in the small gap between the wall and the closet. With his butt facing Monica. Comma you um, Nero, instead of answering, his black tail tapped the floor with a plop. Oh. He was sulking. Geez, Nero, you really are, Monica muttered in a troubled tone, and Nero said, still tapping the floor with his tail. You left me behind to play all night, moreover you're staying over until morning, W well. Monica was at a loss hearing his response, but the woman who brought her here, Lynn, in her usual maid outfit opened her mouth. Certainly, Miss, Silent Witch. S had a feast accompanied by handsome young men, after which, continued with having Colonel Lust with a handsome man in the brothel, Lyon, as Monica peeled her eyes open, Nero coming out of the gap, tapping Monica's foot with his paw. You've disappointed me, Monica. You're hussy, hussy, how heartless of you. You should learn from Abram, who's Abram, anyway, shouted Monica at which Nero snorted before pulling out a book. It was Nero's favorite adventure novel with Dustin Gunther as its author. Nero often mentioned how great Dustin Gunther's book was. Dexterously turning up the page, he tapped the scene introducing the characters with his paw. Abram's a friend of the main protagonist Bartholomew, and he's a very good and loyal guy. Even when he's tempted by a beautiful woman, 
He says, for me, friendship is more valuable than love, and keeps his friendship with Bartholomew alive. It's so cool, Abram. Bartholomew, Monica had never read the novel, but she had a feeling of having heard its name somewhere. It was also rather recent. Comma you know, I'm currently writing a scene in my new novel about a foolish man who falls in love with a stage actress. And Abram, a friend of the main protagonist Bartholomew, who's in love with the stage actress Catherine says, Oh, I'd like to see her play again with my own eyes, and your expression was exactly like that. Comma? Monica's mouth gaped open as she cried out. Now that he mentioned it. Didn't Felix say that Porter's an antiquarian bookstore owner and novelist? While Nero went on at length about how righteous and compassionate Abram is to the stunned Monica. The kind-hearted Monica decided to keep quiet about the development of Abram, who lives for friendship and is reduced to the stage actress adorer. After getting herself ready, Monica decided to leave the girl's dormitory early with a little more time to spare. Having been informed by Lynn that the assassin who had infiltrated the chess tournament had escaped from the prison, she wanted to think of a countermeasure. Assuming that the man who had disguised himself as Minerva's teacher Eugene Pittman was also capable of impersonating another individual, which would be very troubling. Nero can help her to sense any unusual mana activity. Lynn also can help her to eavesdrop on any suspicious conversations. But these things can be performed because very few people were present at the chess tournament. On the other hand, a lot of people would come and go on the day of the school festival, so asking Lynn to pick up only suspicious conversations among them was almost an impossible task. In addition, some groups will be held magic presentations at the event, so it's doubtful that Nero will be able to detect any unusual mana activity. He might be able to notice it immediately if it was mana from, Quang Flame, or like the time when Cyril's mana gone out of control, but it's unlikely he can detect magic that runs on a small scale. If I keep staying by his highness on the day of the school festival, he might think of me as a suspicious person. In any case, the most reliable way is to give Felix a magic tool that has a defensive barrier function. It was a move that had been used once by Lewis Miller, though the said magic tool was destroyed within three days after its creation. Now that I think about it, that's also the reason I came undercover. Remembering the conversation at that time, Monica laughed helplessly and shoved her hands in her pockets. In her pocket was the magic tool that she had improvised this morning. It was a cheap brooch she bought in the entertainment district and applied a protective barrier to it after Lynn informed her of the assassin's escape. She actually wanted to make it usable as many times as possible, not just a one-time disposable item. Including a function that would allow her to know when the barrier was activated, even if she was far away. However, in order to incorporate multiple functions, it would require her to take a long time to produce and a better gemstone, which was considered by its size and its purity. But with only a cheap brooch within her options, all she could do was applying a simple formula to it. But I've increased the strength of the barrier, so that should be enough to protect him when the worst case scenario happens. The question is, how would she give this brooch to Felix? She wished he could keep it with him all the time preferably unnoticed. The magic tool that Monica made was a brooch made of amber on a poorly plated base. The size of the brooch is such that it can be held in Monica's hand and hidden. If she put it in the pocket, he would notice it when he put his hands in. Even if she put it on the coat, he would notice it as well when he take his coat off. In any case, all of the students would change their uniform to that of Noble's formal attire when the closing party's coming up. If that's the case, should I hide it in his U underwear? I suppose that's too far even for his safety. Tim. Is there any other way? You 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 you. I can't think of any method. Monica racked her brains as she walked. The whole reason she left the dormitory a little early was to figure out how to make Felix keep this brooch. But at this rate, she would end up arriving at the school with no idea what to do with it. 
Having all these thoughts in her mind had left her to forget her footing and overlook the slight budge in the ground. As expected, after her foot caught on it, she lost her balance and fell flat on the ground. Fujiwa, in the nick of time, she managed to bring her palms to hold the ground, avoiding falling on her face, but her palms still hurt. Come and my palm hurts. Monica stood snifflingly and continued with her way to the school totteringly without even notice that the brooch was dropped when she's falling over. To tell the truth, things that Monica overlooked were not only the dropped brooch. In fact, there was a female student walking a little behind Monica. The girl witnessed the whole thing until Monica fell down and dropped the brooch. It was the student council secretary Bridget Graham a girl known as one of the three most beautiful ladies in the school. Having witnessed Monica drop the amber brooch, she picked it up and lifted it to her eye level to stare at it. By all appearances, it was a poorly made, cheap brooch. But if you look through it in the light, you can see a thin layer of magic formula floating in the amber stone. Kama Bridget took out a handkerchief, wrapped the brooch, then put it in her pocket then proceeded to walk away as if nothing had happened. Unable to think of a good way to have Felix wear the brooch, Monica arrived at the student council room to find that Felix and Cyril had already arrived there. Morning, Monica, unlike the time when he greets her as Zeke, Felix greeted her with a gentle and kind princess smile. Monica politely replied to Felix and Cyril as she bowed, while glancing at Felix's clothes. For some reason, Monica couldn't think of a way to sneak the brooch onto his perfectly dressed white uniform. Maybe I should just give it directly and ask him to put it on. But how should I ask him? What's the best line for asking so that his highness will definitely be inclined to wear the brooch? Should I tell him, I want you, the exceptional fashionable person, to put this on, like that? But this brooch is too dull for an exceptional fashionable person, and it's designed for women in the first place. Drawing on all the wisdom she had accumulated ever since leaving the cabin to this day, Monica devised a way to make a request that would make Felix want to wear the brooch. Then, an idea crossed her mind. Right, the entertainment district had hinted her the way. This is it, this is the only way. This should be worked. If you wear this brooch, it could bring you some fortunes, all right, let's go with that. But it ended with a disappointing conclusion, which came from how Dora's trick to make men swoon over. It had a similar concept as to how Uncle Street Vendor presenting their goods. Nevertheless, Monica was determined to get the brooch out of her pocket, as if this was a good idea. Huh? No matter how hard she rummaged through her pockets, she could not find the brooch. Even when checking the other pocket just to be sure, she still found no brooch. Dee Dee don't tell me, it dropped at that time? Monica flapped her jacket and skirt as she stomped her feet to check if the brooch was caught in the hem of her jacket or skirt. But the brooch still didn't come out. Comma Treasurer Norton, what are you doing? Cyril stared at Monica's odd behavior, to which Monica replied with cold sweats running down, her eyes darting around. W well, you see. I, right, I'm practicing ballroom dance for the upcoming ball. I am looking forward to the ball, in response to her words, Cyril's eyes slightly widened. But, he immediately wrinkled his brow and grunted. Comma you're not going to tell me that those bizarre steps are a dance, are you? What were those training days for, I I? Oh oh of course I remember. Look, one two three. One, two, three. Monica smiled tensely, as she did some ballroom dancing steps on the spot. And the way Cyril earnestly looking at her was so scary. Just then, the door opened with Bridget coming into the room. She greeted everyone at the entrance with a good day to you and gave a cold look to Monica, who was doing her dance steps. She did not say anything more. As a matter of fact, Bridget didn't even try to talk to Monica perhaps thinking it was not worth it. A while later, Neil and Elliot arrived, bringing all the student council members together, and Felix opened his mouth. Okay, I guess everyone's here. 
In tomorrow school festival starts tomorrow. Let's make sure we have everything in place and do our best to make it a great day for everyone. What should I do? I can't give His Highness the best possible protection without that barrier magic tool. Monica inwardly clutched her head in anguish. Bridget was looking at her with a probing look, but of course, Monica didn't notice. And so, with a great deal of uncertainty, the Serendia Academy Festival was about to begin. Character's Introduction for Azeroth GT Silent Witch September 20, 2021 4 minutes characters that had appeared so far. Format, Name, Age. Monica Everett, 17, Silent Witch, the youngest of the seven sages, she goes by the name Monica Norton while undercover. Before her adoptive mother, Hilda Everett took her in, her name was Monica Rain. Nero, undetermined, Monica's familiar, a black cat. He called Monica Hussey despite not knowing what it mean. Student council members Felix Ark Riddle, 18. Second Prince of the Riddle Kingdom. Student Council President of Serendia Academy. His maternal grandfather was Duke Crockford. Interested in magic and a huge fan of Silent Witch. He refers to himself as Baron Eguin hanging out at night. Cyril Ashley, 18. He is the adopted eldest son of Marcus Hyen. Ice Spells User. It's been discovered that he's never seen Monica's face properly. At most, he only looks at her hair or hands when facing her. Bridget Graham, 18, daughter of Marcus Shelbury. Secretary of the Student Council. A talented woman with high self-esteem. The one who picked the brooch that Monica dropped. Elliot Howard, 18, the eldest son of Count Durs V. Secretary of the Student Council. Cheerful and frivolous. Strict to both other people and himself. Recently have been taking the role of caretaker. Neil Clay Maywood, 17, eldest son of Baron Maywood. General Affairs Manager of the Student Council. Has a quiet and reserved personality. He's actually a devilishly strong chess player. Cyril and Elliot have never beaten him at chess. Other characters in the Academy Lana Kalit, 17. Baron's daughter. Her father is a wealthy merchant and is well versed in fashion. Monica's classmate. She was shocked to find that the corset she had worn when she was 12 was a perfect fit for Monica. Claudia Ashley, 17, the daughter of Marcus Hyen. Cyril's adopted sister. Noelle's fiancé. Her relationship with her brother is not the best, but she sure knows how to work him. Glenn Dudley. 17, a new student who transferred in at the same time as Monica. An apprentice magician. He doesn't know any names of each piece in the chess, but he thinks the checkmate word was really cool, so he wants to say it at least once. Benjamin Molding, 18, third year. Son of a court musician. He uses music as a metaphor for everything. He is actually the cousin of Miss Mabel who appeared in V6C10. He seems to have a bloodline that is passionate about art. Isabel Norton, 16, the daughter of Count Kerbeck. A collaborator of Monica who pretends to be a villainess. Actually, she wanted to go and cheer Monica in the chess tournament. But it was unnatural for the villainess who tormented her to go to cheer her, so she held back. Later, she cried in frustration. Characters of the other school Barney Jones. 17, a student of Minerva. Count's second son. He was a genius boy who mastered abbreviated chanting in his early teens but was overwhelmed by Monica's talent. Since then, he seems to have had a twisted obsession with Monica. Roberto Vinkel, 16, a student of Temple. A fearless guy who proposed Monica based on chess. A student exchange from the Randall Kingdom. He's an aspiring knight. A skilled swordsman, a strong chess player, and good at magic and general education. A high-spec guy actually, but his love life is no better than a clunker. Teacher Group McGregan, 69, Practical Magic Teacher. He refers to others with Chu. He used to teach at Minerva, 
a training magician institute. Boyd, 45, chess class teacher. A robust skinhead man. He thinks his students are the cutest. Dan Redding, 40, a teacher of Temple. A little skittish and germaphobic. He thinks his students are the cutest, but Roberto Vinkel's outburst really hurts his head. Eugene Pittman, a teacher of Minerva. Killed when heading his way to the chess tournament. Characters of Entertainment District Madame Cassandra, undetermined, owner of the house of Madame Cassandra. Her eyes exuded a strong impression. Doris, 20, prostitute girl in the house of Madame Cassandra. The most popular girl in the store. A very caring girl. Porter, 42, owner of the antiquarian bookstore. Friend of Monica's late father. His pen name is Dustin Gunther. In fact, this name had appeared in V1C1. Benedict Rain, death at 35, Monica's father. He was a talented researcher. Other characters Darius Knightley, 63, Duke Crockford. The most influential noble in the country. Felix's maternal grandfather. Wildean, undetermined, Felix's chamberlain. A high-ranking water spirit that can take the form of a lizard. He serves as a body double for Felix when he goes out at night. Casey Groove, 17, Baron Bright's daughter. Feels so much gratitude toward the Randall Kingdom. After a failed attempt to assassinate Felix, she now lives quietly in a monastery. Mary Harvey, undetermined, one of the seven sages, star oracle witch. An astrologer expert who forecasts the country's future by predicting the star. Fond of handsome boys. In fact, all her servants in her mansion are handsome boys. Lewis Miller, 27, one of the seven sages, barrier magician. Previously, he just happened to be present where Monica had been started to undress after drinking alcohol, when his wife confidently appeared, at that time his face was really pale. Lindbergh Field, undetermined, a high-ranking wind spirit who has a contract with Lewis. Creator of the nonsensical proverb. She is often found in the form of a beautiful woman in a maid uniform, but she can also be a man or a bird. She has no specific gender. Question mark? Yuan, undetermined, the real culprit of Eugene Pittman's death. Excels in magic and martial arts alike. Also can change his face at will. Heidi, late teens, a girl with thick, gallant eyebrows. Ewan's comrade. Seven sages, order by age, star oracle witch, Mary Harvey, Jules magician, Emmanuel Darwin, canon magician, Bradford Firestone, barrier magician, Lewis Miller, thorn witch, Raoul Roseberg, silent wicked, Monica Everett. Extra Story 6, Ashley Siblings Tea Party Azareth GT Silent Witch September 23, 2021 9 minutes Cyril Ashley was not the kind of person who took the initiative to hold a tea party. But just two days before the school festival, he rented one of the private tea rooms in the school. Moreover, he only invited one person, and that's his sister Claudia Ashley. Both siblings were not the type who would have a friendly and harmonious chat at a tea party. In other words, he invited her to talk in private in the name of a tea party. Perhaps understanding this notion, Claudia quietly took a sip of her tea with a deeply annoyed expression on her beautiful face, and said, So what do you want from me for having invited me here? Cyril's glad he didn't have to make some pleasantries as he himself had no intention of making idle chit-chat, so he spoke briefly of his reasons for calling Claudia. Let me borrow your dress. Claudia was silent for a full ten seconds as she lifted her cup of tea. During this time, she didn't even blink, which made Cyril feel uneasy, as if he was talking to a wax figure. After having fully stirred up her brother's anxiety, Claudia said a few words. Comma I had no idea my dear brother had a thing for cross-dressing, Cyril felt the urge to shout, but he held it in and said with a twitch in his cheek. Why is it assumed that I'm going to wear it, oh, you haven't heard? Well, 
According to the voting held in the school secretly to decide the suitable person for the heroine of the festival play, the first Queen Amelia, Bridget Grant got the first place as a result, and you came in second. What? He had never heard any of it. Sitting across from Cyril, who was in utter disbelief, Claudia smiled a meaningful and eerie smile that stirred up anxiety in the viewer. For your information, I got the third place. To be honest, I'm not even happy to be ranked in such a thing, but I couldn't stop laughing when I saw your name and mine lined up in second and third place, smiled Claudia beautifully but emotionlessly. Cyril, who had no idea that such a vote was being held in secret, gritted his teeth. Well, whatever the result of the vote, student council members like Bridget and Cyril can't afford to be there on stage, and Claudia would never be in the play given her personality. In the end, Miss Elian, who was placed fourth, was chosen to play the role of Queen. Elian is a distant relative of Felix from his mother's side, and is one of the three most beautiful women in the school, along with Bridget and Claudia. Though she was somewhat of a dreamy, delicate, and fleeting girl, it would be another matter whether she was suitable for the role of Queen Amelia, which was a strong, noble, and wise woman. Comma so. Could you tell me your reason for asking me to borrow my dress? After having given many sarcastic remarks to her brother, Claudia returned to the topic at hand with an indifferent look on her face. Cyril himself did not want to continue with the current topic, so he cleared his throat lightly and told her the circumstances. Well, you see, I hope you could lend your dress to Treasurer Norton. Students are expected to wear formal attire when attending the ball at the end of the school festival. Since no one participates in school uniform. However, given Monica's circumstances and personality, we can safely assume that she didn't own any dress. And as a member of the student council, she could not afford to be absent from the ball. If Treasurer Norton were to attend a ball in school uniform, it would be a disgrace to our student council or in other words, to His Highness. And it's my duty as His Highness's right-hand man to make arrangements in advance so as not to embarrass His Highness. Students can borrow a dress from one of their classmates, so what I heard, at Claudia's remark, Cyril stiffened for a moment, then drank his tea with a rather restless gesture, but then snorted haughtily. Then, my request won't be a problem for you, yes, of course it will. There's no way my dress would fit on Monica, though it would look much better on you. The height difference between the tall Claudia even for a girl, and the petite Monica was too great. If anything, Cyril, who was slender despite being a boy, was closer to Claudia's size. In secret, Cyril was disturbed by this notion as a blue streak popped up on his temple, but he kept his expression as if nothing happened before opening the lid of the sugar pot. Claudia watched him impassively and said, You know, I've been wondering, what's made my dear brother, who would prefer death than having a tea party with me, had invited me to his tea party. I see, now I understand, I told you, this is to ensure the success of the school festival, you must have really wanted to see Monica in a dress, the spoon and sugar inside the sugar pot spilled over into Cyril's teacup. But when the spoon almost dropped into the cup, he hurriedly put the spoon back into the sugar pot and glared at Claudia. A student council member is a role model for all students. That's why I've made the necessary arrangements so to uphold that goal. Claudia was no longer listening to Cyril as she took a bite of the cookie with a look of deep concern on her face, but when she looked at the vase of flowers on the table, she suddenly remembered something. That reminds me, is Neil, why does the name of General Affairs Manager Maywood come up here? What's wrong with me talking about my own fiancé? So, will Neil be busy this year? Of course he will. On the day of the festival, Felix was probably the busiest person on the surface since he's to greet everyone. But if you think who's the busiest person behind the scenes, it was actually General Affairs Manager Neil. Managing supplies arranging meals, and so on, and when there are problems that arise, he had to deal with them. Moreover, there are many other things to do, 
such as keeping in close contact with the heads of each department before sharing all those information with the student council members. Once Cyril affirmed the obvious, Claudia lowered her long eyelashes and let out a sigh with a slightly depressed look on her face. Comma I see. I guess I won't get any flower this year either, flower? Oh, you mean the custom giving floral ornaments, at Serendia Academy, there's a custom of boys giving flower ornaments to girls during the school festival. A flower ornament represents the expression of I want you to be the first to dance with me at the ball, and if the girl who received the ornament wore it, it meant that she had accepted the invitation to dance. The colors of the flowers and ribbons were often the same as the color of the giver's hair and eyes, so those who look at them can easily tell who gave them to them. Though it's not a mandatory event, most of the people who participated actually have already been engaged. Comma I didn't dance with Neil at the ball last year, Maywood General Affairs Manager is a very busy man, after all, and I didn't even get a floral ornament, what does it matter? Flower ornaments are just an event for fun, Claudia tilted her head slightly with a doll-like blank expression. Her beautiful lapis lazuli eyes looked at her brother in a somewhat content manner. Comma you don't understand woman's heart at all, Cyril fell silent and Claudia mumbled to herself, hardly moving her mouth. Comma do you know how a girl who hasn't received a floral ornament is looked at? A leftover who is not taken in by anyone that's just their assumptions. At least on the boys' side, they don't look at girls that way, exactly, even if the boys don't think so, the girls just take it upon themselves to make assumptions about each other, deceitful, isn't it? Cyril gulped as he felt the chill in Claudia's voice that sent shivers down his spine. Then he opened his mouth to cover up the fact that he was pressured by his sister. But, you, you'd received floral ornaments from a dozen people at last year's school festival. Despite the fact that she has a fiancé named Neil, there were always a number of people who come forward every year to claim that they are worthy of being Claudia's fiancé. Claudia's overwhelming beauty and brains must be coveted by those who want excellent and beautiful children. That's why the direct bloodline of the Marcus Hyen household is highly regarded even within the kingdom. Those who think that they are more suitable to be Claudia's husband than the son of a humble baronet will flock to Claudia with flower ornaments on the day of the school festival. Dot. I would never accept flowers from anyone but Neil. Claudia looked at Cyril with a look of deep contempt. Giving him a look of you should not make me say something that is so obvious now, Cyril felt slightly awkward and cleared his throat. General Affairs Manager Maywood is an honest man. The only reason he didn't send you a floral ornament is probably that he was too busy to dance that day, Claudia probably knew that, too. I guess so, she muttered shortly her lapis lazuli eyes looking idly outside. And then, as if talking to herself, she murmured. Actually, I neither like nor dislike you, but, now, that's out of the blue, if I had to pick one, I'd say I like Neil. Cyril snorted haughtily and took a sip of his sweet tea. It's just that their eyes are too blind to see the capabilities of general affairs manager Maywood, yes, they are muttered Claudia in an unusual gentle voice. As he sipped his tea, Cyril thought of a certain girl. Student Council Treasurer Monica Norton was the cause of Cyril's concern. Does she also want a flower ornament from someone? Would she be feeling miserable if no one gave her a flower ornament? No, I doubt Treasurer Norton would want to dance in the first place. Cyril's concerns were unfounded, of course. Monica who hated to be seen in public and was not good at dance, would hardly want to dance at a ball. The day before the school festival, Monica Norton arrived at the student council room, but she seemed to be acting strangely. She suddenly flapped her clothes on the spot and performed a bizarre step. Comma Treasurer Norton, what are you doing? Cyril gave her a stare, and Monica stiffly responded with a smile. W well, you see. I. Right, I'm practicing ballroom dance for the upcoming ball. I am looking forward to the ball, 
Those words shocked Cyril from the bottom of his heart. That treasurer Norton was interested in the dance. Not only was she interested in dancing, but she was also looking forward to it. He had thought she would never be interested in the ball, but, could it be, no wait, come to think of it, Monica was wearing makeup on the day of the chess tournament. Maybe she has become interested in those things that normal girls like to do. That in and of itself was not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, but, why did he feel bothered? And so much of it. As if to deceive his bewilderment, Cyril raised his eyebrows and stared at Monica. Comma you're not going to tell me that those bizarre steps are a dance, are you? What were those training days for, I I? Oh oh of course I remember. Look, one two three, one two three. After saying that, Monica tried to do some dance steps on the spot. It was a terrible step. The steps he taught her a while ago were a little better. Ah, now I understand. Cyril realized what was bothering him. If Monica performed badly at the dance ball, it would be a disgrace to the student council. The thought of it had made him feel uneasy. That's why it bothered him so much. That must be it. It had to be. Therefore, he thought of a simple solution. If I or His Highness take the lead, Treasurer Norton's dance will be a little better. But I can't trouble His Highness with this, so it's only logical for me to look after her. So Cyril concluded, and the fuzziness in his chest cleared up. But he didn't seem to notice, that Neil was looking at him strangely as he began to work in a very good mood. Extra Story 7, In the Land of the North Azeroth GT Silent Witch September 26, 2021 10 minutes as a high-ranking wind spirit. Lynn's flight spell works by moving a semi-spherical barrier she created. To put it another way, it's like riding in a small invisible carriage, which is why it can move several people at once. And now, sitting on one knee in such semi-spherical barrier that moving through the sky was Lewis Miller, silently reading a book. At first glance, he may look like a strange person reading a book hovering in midair while moving at high speed. But there's no one using flight spell in the vicinity, and fortunately, only the birds in the sky were watching this scene. It would take several hours to reach their destination, even with Lynn's flight spell. The ever busy Lewis didn't like to waste time, so he used the travel time to read. You sure read some imposing book, Sir Lewis. Whom do you intend to curse and kill, while keeping her body facing forward to maintain the flight barrier? Lynn turned her head around to look at Lois. Lynn may have been trying to imitate human gestures, but to Lois, it looked like an owl turning its head. To put it simply, it was uncanny. This is not some sort of spell book. And keep in mind that I don't curse people I don't like, I beat them up directly. That book doesn't seem to be written in this country's language, it's a book written by the Empire. After all, after saying that, Lewis flipped through the pages. What he was reading now was a book concerning medical spell, a subject that was banned and restricted in this country. This book was also not allowed to be taken out by the general public, but he had taken it out with the authority of the Seven Sages. Lynn, I assume you have seen with your own eyes the assassin who broke into the chess tournament, indeed, did the assassin who was pretending to be Eugene Pittman use any kind of illusion? Lynn was silent for a moment as she thought about it, and then did the dexterous trick of shaking her head in a position with her head still turned back. No, that assassin might be a magician, but he didn't use any kind of illusion. The guards who had arrested the assassins had also confirmed this, so there was no doubt about it. After all, using an illusion spell to create some deceptive image in the surrounding was very inefficient, in terms of mana usage. Lewis himself may be able to maintain the illusion for a few tens of seconds, but to constantly maintain the illusion for several hours is first and foremost impossible with the amount mana humans have. The only beings who are capable of impersonating others through illusion are those high-ranking water spirits who are good at this kind of spell. And the assassin who killed Eugene Pittman was not a spirit, but a human. 
As Lewis held a page he was reading with his fingers and fixed his misaligned monocle, he muttered to himself. The way that man impersonated Eugene Pittman, it was neither an impersonator nor a disguise. It wasn't any kind of illusion as well. The only thing I can think of is, body manipulation spell. Body manipulation spell refers to the art of pouring mana into a person's body to strengthen or change the body. Originally, the purpose of this spell was to heal damaged bodies, such as returning altered organs to their normal form, but if it could transform damaged organs and skin, it would not be impossible to change the shape of a face. However, body manipulation spell is considered forbidden magic, except in one country. Body manipulation spell has been lifted as part of medical magic in the Empire. If that's the case, there's a good chance that the assassin, is someone from the Empire. Casey Groove's attempted assassination of the Second Prince using the, Quang Flame, was related to the Randall Kingdom, a small country between the Riddle Kingdom and the Empire. And the assassin at the chess tournament had shown him the tale of the Shadow of the Empire. These two incidents that occurred in such a short period of time caused Lewis to develop certain concerns. And to ascertain it, he had come all the way to the frigid north. The scenery spread out below was speckled with white. A chilly wind may still be blowing in the capital, but in this area, snow has already begun to fall. And in the middle of the snow-covered mountains, far from human habitation, laid an old monastery on slightly open land. Sir Lewis, I've come up with an innovative landing method unique to this land, may I try it? Hearing that suggestion from the beautiful maid, Lewis frowned before glaring at Lynn. You want to release your flight spell in midair and use the snow as a cushion to land on, it's as you say, are you a child who gets excited by snow? Stick to the safe landing, oh, that's a shame. Lin responded with an impassive expression that didn't look the least bit disappointed, and slowly lowered her altitude. In front of the monastery, a young sister was shoveling snow with a shovel in her hand. The sister was not surprised to see Louis coming down from the sky. She just held her hands over her eyes to look at Louis and Lin. Landing quietly on the snow, Louis stared back at the sister who was looking at him, then gave her a now. That's a surprise response with a thin smile. I thought you were a very composed sister who wasn't surprised to see flight magic, but, it was you, huh? I guess compared to the shock of crashing into the ground while spinning, it's kind of cute. Having said that, the daughter of Count Bright, Casey Groove, thrust her shovel into the snow at her feet. The elderly sister in charge of the monastery ordered Casey to show Lewis and the others around and then retreated into the chapel, wanting nothing to do with them. For these women who live away from the world, visitors from the outside, especially a man like Lewis, are probably not welcomed. The same seemed to be true for Casey, as she began to talk after having guided Lewis and Lynn into the parlor without offering them any tea. So. What do you want from me? I think I've told you pretty much everything I can, Lewis responded to Casey's brusque attitude with a mature smile. There's something I wanted to ascertain, our people had nothing to do with that assassination attempt. It was something my father and I did on our own, you could believe whatever you think, at least, although your father seems to think otherwise, Casey's mouth quivered at Lewis' indirect remark. Lewis took out a wrap cloth from his pocket and gently unfolded it on the table. What lay within the cloth were the remnants of red stones of various sizes. Do you recognize what this is, the remnants of the, quang flame, I used? Instead of correcting her, Lewis smiled and continued with his words. Your father claimed to have bought it from a traveling peddler, but I suspect that someone from the Randall Kingdom gave it to your father. Are you saying that the people of Randall had instigated my father? Do you have any idea how much the Quang Flame costs? Forgive me, but it's not something the not so wealthy Count Bright can easily afford. Magical tools can be very costly. And with a high level of perfection at that, it's not something that the Count Bright household can easily get their hands on. When there are so many cheaper ways to assassinate someone, 
Why did Count Bright choose the Quang Flame? It's more plausible to believe that someone gave Count Bright the Quang Flame and instigated him to do so. Casey was probably thinking about this possibility too. As she bit her lip with a grim face and tried her best to contain her agitation so that she would not say anything that could be used against her father. Looking at the resilient figure, Louis picked up one of the pieces of redstone and held it up to the light. The ruby used in this, Quang Flame, is extremely pure. I had it authenticated by an expert, and he said that it must have come from Glocken. Glocken, you haven't heard of it? It's a mine in the southeastern part of the empire. The amount of ore mined is not very large, but it yields high-quality rubies that are ideal for making magical tools. But the empire exports very little of the ore from the said mine, so it's difficult to find on the market. Lewis put the red stone back on the table with a clatter. The ringing sound echoed rather loudly in the serene monastery. Lewis narrowed his gray purple eyes and looked at Casey. The Quang flame, that Count Bright entrusted to you is made in the Empire. Do you know what this implies? Casey immediately turned pale at those words. Clever girl. With that single statement, she speculated one frightening possibility. If the person who gave Count Bright the Quang flame was assumed to be someone from Randall, the next question would be where did the Randall person get the Empire's Quang flame? This brought her to one hypothesis. And that was. It's possible that the Randall Kingdom and the Empire are working together behind the scenes. A war between the Riddle Kingdom and the Allied forces of the Empire and the Randall Kingdom could very well happen in the future. Casey must have finally understood this realization, as she clenched her fists tightly in her lap, but then opened her mouth with her head lowered. Come as far as I know. I've never seen anyone from the Empire entering or leaving my hometown. The only people who frequented my household were Randall nobles whose names even I knew. Have you ever seen of your father sending letters to the Empire? No, I see. It would have been nice to get some evidence of the connection to the Empire here, but from her testimony, that was not going to be that easy. If the Empire and Randall were somehow tied together, the Empire with its overwhelming national power, would obviously be the master of the master-slave alliance. There was also a possibility that the nobles of the far end of Randall were unaware of the relationship between their country and the empire. There's no end to the what-ifs, but it's always better to remain cautious of the shadow of the empire. I guess there's no more information I can squeeze out of you. Since there seems to be no sign of tea being served. I guess I will take my leave soon, as Lewis rose from his chair, Casey gave him a short word of wait to stop him. Lewis turned his disinterested eyes to Casey. He was a fairly busy person and disliked wasting his time. And he didn't think he could have anything more meaningful to say to this girl. Comma is Monica doing well, sure enough, what Casey mentioned was not something worthwhile for Lewis. That's a topic that's less important than the weather if I would say. Well, she's been caught up in a fight with an assassin recently, but still living vigorously, more or less. Casey gulped, widened her eyes at the mention of having fought an assassin. Comma I still can't believe it, honestly. I can't believe Monica is the Seven Sages. I mean, she just seemed like a normal girl, a silent witch, is a normal girl. Lewis couldn't help but chuckle. Even after seeing Monica use no chant magic, Casey still didn't have a clear understanding of Monica. Lewis sat back in his chair and gave a cruelly beautiful sneer. Do you remember the Black Dragon of Wogan incident six months ago? Yeah, silent witch. I mean Monica had chased away the Black Dragon that appeared in Count Kerbeck's territory. Count Kerbeck's territory and Count Bright's territory are relatively close to each other, so that incident was probably no stranger to her. Even more so when the Black Dragon was an existence that gave despair to her people. The flames breathed out by the Black Dragon, or, Black Flame, were unusual flames that burn away even magical barriers. Even for Lewis, who's also known as the Dragon Slayer. Dealing with that incident was not a simple matter. 
I was the one who dragged Miss Silent Witch to defeat the Black Dragon. You see, that little girl was whimpering and saying, scary, scary. When I did so, Casey looked at Lewis in astonishment as he blithely confessed his outrageous deed. Don't you feel that way too? Yet, yeah, I have some fears, too, you know. But what do you think Monica Everett, the silent witch, was afraid of, at that time, in a sobbing voice, Monica said to Lewis, those people of Dragon Knight so scary. Surrounded by so many people I don't know, so scary, is what she said. That little girl was never even a little bit afraid of the black dragon. She, the, silent witch, of the seven sages, was afraid of the dragon knights, humans who came to defeat it. It's quite funny, isn't it? Lewis whispered, but Casey seemed stunned into silence. Looking at her reaction, Lewis cast a pitying glance at Casey. She fears and hates humans from the bottom of her heart, and that's why she can be as cruel as it takes. She's more twisted and heartless than you think. That's why Lewis chose Monica as his helper in the mission to escort the second prince. Don't expect her to have any sympathy for you, Lewis told him sarcastically, and Casey stood up from her chair with a clatter. Then stormed out of the room, before quickly returning with a mug and a small package in her hand. Casey slammed the mug of tea down in front of Lewis and pushed the paper package to him. I've been hesitating whether to give this to her or not, but your words have made up my mind. Please give this to Monica. You don't have to mention my name. Lewis didn't ask about her consent but when he looked at the contents of the paper package, his eyes widened. Casey must have been very upset with what Lewis had said since she's been glaring at Lewis with sharp eyes. It would be easier if you hated her. What a foolish and soft-hearted girl. Lewis let out a sigh in secret and tucked the paper package into his pocket. He then sipped his mug of tea with an elegant gesture and said, I suppose I'll do enough work for this cup of tea, by the way, do you have any sugar or jam?